Avery. I saw the news and uh, I'm sorry, bud. 73, Gaijin. 73. Everybody thinks this is a big joke. It's not funny. Yeah, I mean, but look on the bright side. I mean, it's higher than the great Jaggy. I mean, oh, wait, hang on a second. Oh, it's not. I know you're disappointed, but come on. 73 isn't bad. Disappointed? Disappointed doesn't even begin to describe how I feel right now. I am devastated! There's always the 25th anniversary no, or 30th. No. They have absolutely disrespected my favorite monster! Uh. Okay, tell you what. How about we record a Third Fleet podcast, and after that you'll feel a whole lot better. How's that sound? You, you do that for me? Yeah, of course. Come on. Let's do it. Shields up, Ironbreakers. Work on here coming at you with another episode of the Third Fleet Podcast. And Gaijin, <laughs> Monster Hunter is now 20 years old. It is still not legally allowed to drink. I know. In the well, US. they can drink in Japan. In Japan, oh, I guess it's the, 20s. Drinking age, yeah. I mean, in Portugal, in Portugal, I think they can drink too. I think you can drink at like 16 in Portugal. I think you can start drinking beer at that age. I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> man how how old do you feel now that you know that uh monster is 20 i mean i came into the series much later than you did but i'm also feeling very old did yes. you no yeah. i mean i was i was watching you on the the um 20th anniversary show which was awesome by the way Oh, oh yes. thank you. Yeah, that that was absolutely amazing to be able to be a part of that. Like, you know, being featured on the official Monster Hunter channel. Like, I was like, damn, okay. That 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 was something that I wasn't expecting, but it was really cool. But hearing you talk, I, I would think that you're not... I didn't start this series. I don't think any... I mean, we'd have to go back to episode one of this podcast, really, but I don't think I started any earlier than you did. The, the thing. I mean, the I, thing was, I was me kind of like... I still had this feeling like I'm new to the franchise, like it's been a few years. Because the thing is, when I when I got into Monster Hunter, I was very late to the party, for all intents and purposes. Right? It was already a huge phenomenon here, um, and it already had its biggest selling title. And then I came in very late at Monster Hunter 3G, and so I always had this feeling like I, you know, I've I've experienced a you know a fourth of the all franchise right. we lifetime. But now I'm looking at it, and it's like, wait. I've been in the franchise for like 13 years and it's 20. That's over half its lifetime. Wow. I didn't realize I've been into Monster Hunter for that long. It, it's actually funny. Now Now you're reminding me of our uh, first conversation where we talked about where we started. And you are right. I did start before you. But the thing is, yeah. I, I always see you as starting ahead of me because you started creating content for it before I did. Much earlier before. I, but I actually jumped in on Try. But it's like a tribe didn't click, and then I eventually. Yeah, my original like, videos yeah. was me with my iPhone pointed down on the desk at my 3DS, dude. taking a, some footage of Monster Hunter 4. Yeah, dude, that, that was the funniest thing. Cause like yesterday, before, um, before the the celebrations got started, I was showing people my very first Monster Hunter video. Try to guess which monster I was hunting. I mean, I, I was on the stream. I'd be cheating too. Ah, uh, damn it! <laughs> you were watching. Yeah, it was the Blue Yan Kutku for anybody curious. But yeah, I was I was showing people, and it was the same thing. It was for me. It was, there was a camcorder in front of me, and I was playing the game through the viewfinder on a PlayStation Vita. That was like, so bad, but it was it was funny going back through memory lane. I also showed a, a little bit of like uh, my friend Hengus getting lost when we were fighting Jade Baroth. <laughs> Uh, but it was a good trip down memory lane, just seeing all the, the intros, just walking through the games and 
talking to the directors of each one and all that kind of stuff. And of course, just the banter. I actually chose you over the Japanese. Oh, uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Because well, I... the Japanese stream was shot at Universal Studios Japan. They had a special stage set up and it, it was basically Capcom TV. You had like a bunch of comedians that were mostly annoying. You really? Had, uh, you, could, uh, you had the, you know, uh, the, the the cute hosts that walk you through everything. And I was like, well, you get that John is there and I like her, but no, I got to listen to Rory and the boys. Kogan, <laughs> well, thank and you. But like the, so, um... yeah, but you, it was very different. Cause like they announced the ranking in the Japanese stream before they ever did in the English one. So it's like, I already knew all the results before <laughs> everybody. It was, I, that's the one point I wish they would have synced them. But, you know, other than that, it was it was enjoyable. It, it was funny because afterwards I went to the Japanese stream to see what was different because I, I was told that it was going to be different on the Japanese side of things. And I didn't really understand exactly what was going on. I was like, it, ju- it does just look like a Capcom TV thing, like they do their live yeah. streams sometimes. I thought there were actually Japanese uh, content creators in there as well. Were no, they? No, no, no. It's just, okay. they're, they're just the regular comedians that are there. Okay, because I thought some of those might have been like content creators. They also showed up, they showed off some really cool art, which I don't know who made those things. It was like a, a palico drawn in some flowers or whatever. That was really cool. Oh, yeah, I think they're doing some type of, they, at the end they did a bunch of like, hey, we're doing these collaboration for this like high-end chic art that's going to be super limited. So I think they showed off like those, that like silver and gold or platinum Rathalos Rathian yeah, I, I want. I want one. Cost like ten thousand dollars. I want one of those. Can can I get one? Of those? I yeah, want one of those like really nice Rathalos art. busts. Give me one of those. It's only a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll they, right I mean, that. they had. I mean, even at the exhibit, they had from the tenth anniversary, or the fifteenth one. Like they sold a very limited edition Rathalos themed like motorcycle way back in the day, like really high end. A bike. Like they. You know, it's it's you can do those fun types of like only three are being made. It's gonna be super expensive, but super cool. It's just a fun thing to do, you know. So, but um, and uh, something that obviously happened, and this Capcom kind of tried preparing people for this ahead of time because I remember them posting it like on Twitter and stuff, and they were telling people, "Hey, look, we're not announcing anything new at this event," but apparently people were still expecting it and they were really mad because there weren't any new announcements. I was even prefacing my stream by telling people, "Listen, this is this is like a birthday party. This is a celebration, okay? That there's not going to be announcements. You guys you guys I better think, be ready." I think ready. Capcom misunderstood at least in the Japanese side, I saw them say, you know, hey, we're not going to have any... Right up front at the very start of the show, though, yeah. like, we're not going to have any news or anything on Wild, so please, please understand kind of idea. Yeah. But the thing is, is like, that opens the door of, wait, so you're saying you might announce a remake or a remaster? It's oh, like, just say God. that there's not going to be... And I think they did somewhere, but they, I'm like, no, just they, be really clear and just they say did on there Twitter. won't be anything. No titles, no anything. Yeah, but like, not everyone's on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but... it's like... You know, I, there's this is not a, a venue to announce new product yeah all. but that they, they I, but then I people but then people will be like wait when they say new that doesn't mean it's not old stuff that's coming out again you know it's 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 interesting because at yeah. the end of the day that the community is just so passionate about it that we all just kind of want we just want on, give, more monster give us Hunter. just a tasty morsel of something <laughs> tasty morsel i gotta of say though i do find it really bizarre that they announced monster hunter stories one remaster re- not remake remaster for playstation 4 and switch um, switch, and, switch. I, and and steam it's coming to, to everything and steam, except yeah. except xbox xbox sucks i, I was um, I'm, I'm, I'm very sad because like i wish that more games would come to xbox because because like i don't have an xbox i don't have a dog in this race i, I yeah. ultimately it doesn't matter to me because i'm anything I mean, that i want i can get on pc pretty much but it just kind of yeah. sucks because there are people that their console of choice was the Xbox, and now they yeah. they're they're losing access to. All I just of think these it's games. stupid, like because it's it's like that that GIF that you see or the meme of like the the guy riding a bicycle and sticks a stick in the wheel and falls over and cries foul about how he's being treated unfair. Like oh they did this to me even though he did it to himself. It's like you have all these publishers who will like not release on Xbox or they'll do it like a year late when it no one cares anymore. 
And then they're like, hey, we got very low sales, so it doesn't make financial sense. I'm like, well, yeah, you gimped it. You did time releases on PlayStation or you didn't release it. Of course, you you, you didn't even give it a fighting chance. Yeah, it's, you put it back 200 yards. Like, let it let it race, man. Uh, it's like cause nah, it's there's – I've seen a lot of um, console wars in the in in the Twitter space more more often than than usual in the last couple of months. Like more people are getting propped up because it's basically engagement farming, right? Somebody comes up with yeah, the most yeah. outrageous. Say something controversial, clip. and yeah, boom, yeah, yeah, you yeah. get clicks. I've seen more and more of that stuff happening and, and it really saddens me to see so many people going after these console wars and being like, my box is the better because your box sucks. My box has this game and my box plays this game at this frame. It's like, bro, these are boxes that you play your video games in. It's like, just chill. Just chill. It's the same thing as saying, hey, I'm on an Android or an iPhone. It's like, I don't care. What There's probably on. people that are upset about Yay. that too. <laughs> Okay, well then, it. then get them upside. What do you use as your daily driver, as they call it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm mean, an iPhone guy, but that's just a personal choice. I'm I'm, I'm an in I, the ecosystem. I'm an iPhone guy because it's usually hand me downs. <laughs> that's because mm. like I don't care about phones at all, and my father just goes like, "It's like oh, I want to buy the new one, whatever," and then there he usually go. gives me whatever is is left over. Because I really do not give a damn about phones. The only time I ever bought a phone was um you, you remember that the playstation remote app used to be yeah, yeah, exclusive yeah. to like their sony phones and i was like yeah, i want to be able to play i want to be able to play my my playstation on my phone that that'd be good so i bought an xperia at some point Never that's did the it again only phone i've ever bought but you know since then remote play is accessible everywhere if yeah. it wasn't i might have bought another xperia phone because every now and then yeah. it is convenient to be able to log into the console do some random stuff on the phone but other than yeah that, but bringing us back what i was gonna say was um before i forget is just i find it really bizarre one, I, I, I put out a tweet because I've I been milling over because all, all in all, I'm really happy they're doing it, right? Yeah, of course. Like, Monster Hunter Stories 1 was great. I mean, I do think that you have kind of an issue where 2 was really what we all wanted it to be because 1 was so good that the desire was give me something like that, but give me more story, voice acting, more flexibility with monsters, more monsters, more adventure. And they delivered, right? It's it's one on steroids. It's basically Monster Hunter yeah. Stories 2. So I think for really big diehard fans they're gonna love to go back to one and play it even if it seems like oh this it's, system that was really fleshed out in two is now more basic you know it's yeah. like it'll feel dated but if that's okay then i think there's a lot of fun to be had and i love how it set up the whole like the, the idea of writers i think they spent a lot of time on that like the culture of what makes the difference between a hunter and a rider and now we can also get a finally we get a a voice acted version of the fungus among us Line which is going to be great, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, like, I mean, but it's dated, right? Like, let's let's be honest here. Yeah. So, I think you know, for some people, it'll just make sense to play two. It's definitely the better version, and it stands on the shoulders of one. So it's like, wait, they're not bringing two to PlayStation? Like, what the heck? And then they announced just the other day, "Hey, two is coming on the same day to PlayStation." I'm like, why, yeah. <laughs> "Why did you announce it at the same time? Like, what the heck, man?" It was it was it was a surprise, but the the thing to me Also, it, like, oh, go ahead. The the thing to me was uh was still what I was saying before Stories 2 came out, like a couple of months before. I remember like tweeting about this and even just like hounding people, my contacts both at Nintendo as well as Capcom being like, why aren't you putting Stories 1 out first? Yeah, People should play Stories right 1 before. That would have been brilliant to have that ahead of 2 so that people could play 1 oh, yeah. and then play 2 would made a lot more sense than one coming out now. But at the same time, it's there's not going to be a whole lot happening in terms of Monster Hunter this year. So yeah, that so way, it's there's a good thing. two massive Monster Hunter games that you can go and play if you want to, yeah. even though they're the spin -off I would just games. hate. I would just hate for PlayStation owners to think Stories 1 is the place to start. I, I, I really strongly believe that if you only have the money for one of them, or the time and the you patience play for two. one, you should play two. Yeah. Do not worry about one. I'm not saying that because you're not missing out on anything, but you're going to get all the good parts of one into. So yeah. like 
don't worry about it. And you don't need to know what went on in one or anything. And that's it's that's what fun. I was about to say. You don't need to know the story of one to enjoy two. Yeah. There are two different stories. There's like characters that come back from Yeah, there's some nice like two. cameos and you're like, "Oh, it's that dude," but it's it's just yeah. fan service at that point, so. So so it's like if if you guys are wondering, "Oh, should I buy one and then play that and then play two? It's like if at any point in time you can only afford one of those games, get Two. Play two. Play two. Two is the one to, to start at. And for people that are already played two, like maybe you got it on the Switch or on PC or whatever, now you can also play one, which is cool. Yeah. U- ultimately, games making it to current platforms to me is always a win. Because always a good thing, yeah. I've, I've always, always said, I don't want to play one on phone, okay? I'm, I'm not going to play one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't play games on phone. It, it just, I can't do it. So, you know, having one on, phone, on, um, on PC and on console and whatnot is going to be good stuff. Yeah, I agree. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, a weird. I also think that I think the ball is in Sony's court with their bad communication because you know I'll take a jab at Sony any moment I can but no I like, don't the, believe the fact you. is is that people around the world were like wait PS4 and they're baffled about it right and it's yeah. like I know that Sony's done a really bad com- job at communicating that PS5 is backwards compatible and plays PS4 games um, but I kind of think it would have been a, a smart idea to say hey this is coming to the PS4 and put in like parentheses can also be enjoyed on the yeah. PlayStation 5 or something because there's so many people are like but why not playstation 5 that makes no sense it's like actually this means that more people can play it because yep. there's a lot of playstation 4 owners out there that do not have a ps5 like this just opens the door even wider so that's a good thing i think i think it's the 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 situation is also the reason why they're communicating ps4 is because you know how when you have games on PS5 that are actually PS4 games, they are backwards compatible, but they're identified as PS4 games, which means stuff like, oh, this is not going to play at 4K or something like that, right? So I think that is the the standard that they're establishing because for Sony, there's a distinct difference between a PS4 game and a PS5 yeah, game. Yeah, they don't have smart delivery. They really should have. Which they, th- this was literally my biggest criticism when PlayStation sent me the PS5 for review. The biggest criticism I had was like, you guys need to figure out something like what Xbox did with the smart delivery yeah. system. Because exactly. I think I, I even the, remember the, the Dream Console is going to be the combination of the two. Yeah, I, I even remember because with the console, they sent me like a code for uh, Miles Morales at the time. And I put in the code, and what it did was it downloaded both versions of the both, game. Both, yeah. And I was like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Why would you download the PS4 and the PS5 version? It doesn't make any sense. But, yeah, yeah they, they, sh- they need to sort that stuff out. But either way, I think it's cool. Stories is, uh, Stories is coming back to most consoles now. It's just, again, I wish they had done, like, a, an Xbox version, which kind of sucks that they didn't, but, you know. <laughs> It is yep. what it is. While we're talking about the, like uh, spin-off games, have you been keeping up with Monster Hunter now? Because you know that I don't play mobile games. I stopped playing. Um, I mean, I see the news. I don't like unfollow them or anything. So I yeah. see some of the stuff that's coming. But it's just, I think we talked in length about, I mean, I think that it's another one of those mobile games that I just, I lament because I see it. I'm like, this has a really fun gum- like gameplay. Like they did a really good job at trans... Like the same way that the Monster Hunter Explorer did. Like they did a good job of translating simplistic hunts and monsters in the game with motion controls. But like the monetization and just the loop is just way too hardcore for me to the point that I'm just kind of like, I can't keep up with this. I'm sorry. So I just, yeah, I lost interest pretty fast. I went back and tried to play it again and then I lost interest again. And now it's still on my phone. So is Pokemon Go, but I haven't touched that in years. Yeah. But it's like, I don't. I just don't have an interest for it, but like they announced okay. that they're doing the um the charge blade. So charge blade is coming yeah. to the, the they thing. teased Kushala, I saw that. And they they announced like some season pass and I was like, Oh <laughs> well, my hope is okay, so you guys put season pass in this one. That means that you don't have to put a season pass in wilds. So that at least I'm hoping that's what that means. I don't want to oh, see I, I would say Months under now is very much Niantic. It's not Capcom. Yeah, Capcom yeah, yeah. is loaning the IP, and so I won't even consider anything that one does as having any impact on the other. 
Yeah, that's that's the same way that I'm going. But yeah, Monster Hunter now is just not that. Uh, yeah, that but it's good to see to they've got a roadmap, like lots of updates. So people who are putting in the time and hours to grind that thing out, I'm sure they're happy. Yeah, it's good stuff. So we also got like a, a bunch of interviews. It was nice to go down memory lane with some of the developers. One of the funniest mm-hmm. things that I feel like they said in the interviews was, when we designed the charge blade, we wanted to make an easy to play weapon. I was like, wait, <laughs> mission failed. <laughs> mission success. And I just tweeted about this this morning, but like, what do you mean? easy people to play in the West, weapon? People in the, well, I don't know what he said in Japanese. I have to actually go back and watch as I was you watching sh- an English stream. You should. I think the subtitle said uh, an easy to understand weapon. I can look at it right now if you want. And yeah, go, exactly go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm actually but, like, curious. Uh, let me start and say, though, that the West never got Monster Hunter 4. The exactly. Charge Blade, when it was introduced in Monster Hunter 4, was not the same weapon it was in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. Oh. They did a lot of changes to that weapon to make it more complex, more uh, bursty. If, if I'm going to borrow my new MMO lexicon, very first <laughs> weapon. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, it's like, there was no, I hate this acronym and I won't ever use it again on this podcast. I hope not. Okay. The SAED or the SAAD. I just call it the ultra and the super. I, you know, like, whatever. Like the boom U-E-D. boom. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> the elemental discharge. The super um, amped elemental discharge. Uh, it sounds God. like yeah. it sounds like that, those Capcom titles where it's like EX plus Alpha. <laughs> I hate it. World exclusive. Like that didn't exist in Monster Hunter Four. The weapon was much more simple. You use your blade, you charge the files, and then every now and then you'd find a way to sneak in the the axe mode. And from there, the most important one was a lot of usage of Elemental Attack Two, the one where you got two yeah. hits for the price of one. And it had really good range. So, so there was, would be a lot of combo paths where we would do that. And then you'd loop back to the uppercut and then loop back to that again. It yeah. wasn't always about blowing off all the charges and going back into sword mode. That was more seen as a risky move uh, or an advanced move if you were really good at positioning. So like we, when I say we, I mean like the, the community in general, at least in Japan. The most common thing to do was to run punish draw on a charge blade. Because you would sheath your weapon a lot, and you'd come at the monster with your axe, hopefully get a KO when you draw the axe, and then or at you least you'd hit him really strike. hard. And then you'd do your elemental two, which gets two strikes. And then from there, you had all these options to go back to sword mode or continue on and do your your super or whatever you wanted. So it was a real simplistic weapon back then. Like the whole idea of like guard points and then going from guard point into a super and all that kind of stuff like that all... All that depth came in Monster Hunter for Ultimate. Interesting. So I think I think they spent so much time on the Insect Glaive and making it a little bit more complex and fun that the Charge Blade felt a little tacked on. But it was really nice because I compare it to second or third generation Longsword. Like there was a beauty with like positioning and distance where you're doing moves. It looks easy, but it's not, right? Like you you have to preempt where the monster is going to be. You got to know your distance, what you can get away with, and there was a dance to it. And that's what the Charge Blade was when it first came out. So that's just context that no one in the West has. So I kind of it kind of sucks that no one got to experience it back yeah, in the beginning because it wasn't like better, but it was different. And I, I really I appreciated it back then for that. Because it was it was really weird for me when he said, "Oh, we wanted to make a weapon that was easy to understand." And I was like, "Wait." What? Charge Blade, which most I... players nowadays consider to be the most mechanically complex weapon in the game. And by the way, I say most players because I don't think like that. I don't think it's that mechanical. I used the complex. video that got my channel started, basically, was, was my tutorial blade? on how to use the Charge Blade in 4G. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I won't deny that it was not. A... Depending on how you approach the different elements of that weapon and, like, what is the the core that you're going back to. It could be easy or hard to understand, depending on how the listener and also how it's described. So I always found it a fun weapon for doing tutorials on because the order in which you introduce some of those can really change how complex it feels or sounds. It's but yeah, it is. It is mechanically pretty complex. It it, it even goes back. It, it's inter- it's so interesting to talk about charge blade because it even goes back to that uh, one time that I was super self conscious and in- and insecure about my own guides because I had. I had just recorded this charge blade guide 
And I was like, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly like I wanted to make it. It's exactly in the order that I wanted to do it. Because I don't script my stuff. Like, I'll have notes, but I don't really script it. So I, I had made the mm. charge blade guide and it was ready to go. And right before I release it, I see that Eric's drops his workshop for the charge blade. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Everybody's going to think I'm copying him. Oh, no. <laughs> this is going to be terrible. I was even thinking, maybe I won't even release it today. I shouldn't do this. This is bad. And then eventually I ended up releasing it anyways. And a lot of people were like, oh, I actually prefer yours and, and whatnot. And I was like, oh, thank God. So some people <laughs> prefer the way that Eric's explained it. A lot of people also prefer the way that I explain it. So there was a market for both uh, guides. And I was like, oh, thank God. Because I, I really yeah. thought that because I was very, I was still very much new in the scene, I was expecting people to accuse me of like plagiarizing Eric's and I was like, oh crap, this is going to go so, but the thing was, I didn't even think that like our guides are going to be completely different, which they were, <laughs> so there was a... <laughs> but it was just like that fear, right? Cause I, cause I was new to the whole creating guides thing and I was like, oh my God, this is going to go so bad. <laughs> it was funny. But yeah, charge blade, one hell of a, of an yeah, so I, Okay, weapon. I. I just located. You found it? The Yeah, the so thing? he said that in the Japanese, he's explained, you know, he was just talking about the insect glaive and how, you know, you use bugs, it was more dynamic, the jumps, mm -hmm. attacks, and all that stuff. And he said on the, the charge, the, they call it the charge axe here, so forgive me if I accidentally call it the charge axe. That's fine. Um, uh, But he says, you know, the, the idea from the, the, the get-go was to create something to juxtapose the slash axe or uh, the switch axe. Which I think has always been largely viewed as being semi-complicated because you have file types. You've got there's a lot of mm -hmm. in between on those modes. It's it's less like I'm see, okay. I'm in mode A. Then I'm going to finish mode B. Then go back to mode A. Like that's more of a fluid one. See, that's that's an interesting thing because even when I was uh, making my guide for Switch X in Rise, I remember thinking about it and being like, bro, I think this weapon is harder to get than the Charge Blade. In yeah, a lot of so ways, because they said of that all they, the, they said it was yeah. purposely thinking about the switch axe and how to make a version of a morphing weapon that would be easier to grasp. So they're like, okay, well, it's a it's a fused weapon. It's got form changes, but charge with the blade, hit hard with the axe. Very easy to understand. Yeah. Where I think like this, the switch axe has problems where because the sword and axe mode are both super good. I prefer playing mostly in axe mode just because. I really find it enjoyable, but that's, you know, charge blade is more integrated. It's meant to use both. I mean, you literally can't hit monsters when your charge, when your blade is filled up, you have to do something. It with bounce, it, it bounces. Now it's really complicated. You could charge your sword and do all sorts of stuff. So it's like, it's, I, I, I love, I love the way that it is now in Swiss world, Army knife. in, in world. I really like it. I didn't like the stuff that they did with a uh, quick switch for rise and sunbreak the fact that you need more maintenance skills that upset me a little bit but it wasn't a deal breaker it was actually the no. the last weapon that, that i played last time i, I even played sunbreak because i've been messing around with a uh, charge blade with return to world and whatnot and charge blade is just so much fun. but yeah we just we just <laughs> turned this into the charge blade podcast all of a sudden for some reason <laughs> <sighs> anyway, yeah. So, tw you want to talk about twentieth anniversary? Yeah, video? the the twentieth anniversary video where they showed like all of the monsters, and we have like the rankings of every single monster. Yeah, going into the rankings though, I had to change my expectations because I was reminded again just how incredible World and Iceborne was on the impact of this game when they they announced that it sold twenty. It's now, I mean, probably because they had a crazy ass sale on it. But they did tip the 25 million sold Damn. for World, which is crazy and so well deserved. That's rookie I mean, numbers. That we so... need we need 50 million. 50. You take, I mean, you take Monster Hunter Four that had like four to five million. Then you have like the Monster Hunter Ultimate was 45 million. You're talking base World alone, 25 million. That is insane. Just really crazy. So I'm thinking, okay, you know what, the memers are going to be talking about you know let's get kezu on the top 10 then you get like the people like me or like hey let's get young cuckoo he, he's our sensei he deserves he wasn't the sensei for people in the world so why would he be on there right i think there was yeah. a very clear 
the amount of mass players that would balance out the memers. So unfortunately, there was no so funny surprises. I just there were some interesting things though because usually like, when they do the polls, it's the same ten monsters usually. But this time it was, it was different. It and was. I think it really showed the impact of Iceborne had on everybody. It's it was very different, and I and I do think that this time around, people sensei was Nargakuga. Because that's a, yeah, he's really high on the list, and it was funny because well, I, I kind of think everyone sensei was a Ner Nergigante to be honest. I mean, Nergigante takes because up two spots in the top ten alone, yeah. which is damn. But like, it was an interesting thing to then juxtapose that with the interviews where I think it was Ichinose san who was saying like, "Oh yeah, when we made Nargakuga, it was just a fast T Rex." Just like, just, oh, make man, him, they, just make him go fast. I mean, I, <laughs> I, like, I had a monster feature on that, but they had to make that thing in like four months. Like it was like really fast. They had to make that game. So yeah. they made, I mean, Narukuga is a Tigrex. That's a cat. I mean, it's the same skeleton and everything, but it's just, let's make him a hell of a lot faster. Boom, done. It came together. I love what they said. I did not realize this was the truth, but... They, what well, they said um, in the the teaser trailer for the game when they only showed Nargo's eyes. Yeah. Uh, and a little silhouette of his jumping is because they didn't have a finished they model. They didn't have a it. model. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's hilarious to think about it. It's like, we got we got nothing. Okay, just dazzle him with smoke and mirrors. It's Just put some red eyes and that'll work great. Don't even worry about it. It's a silhouette because we don't have the model. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but I think hilarious. it also shows not only just the production power behind Capcom, especially in Ichino Sense team, the fact that they were able to do all this. Also, when they're talking about like how they were going to make a portable version of Monster Hunter Tri, and only months before they announced it, they realized, hey, we made a different game. Yeah, it's we... like it's like it's like triple the content. This isn't just a a remake. This is this is a full on sequel. We added in all the weapons back. We added in a crap ton of monsters. We we added in new features like this is g rank like what is this it, so it, they decided to call it, instead of monster Hunter, was it tri world or something dumb they they quick renamed it came up with a new logo and announced it as 3g and that it, was months before they announced it and it really goes to show just like one of the things that i even said during the 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 panel that we had for the 20th uh, anniversary celebration which is it just showcases the passion of this team wherein it's like their boss just says, "Okay, guys, we just need you guys to port this game over," and they're like, they will add "Sorry, as boss, much as they can. <laughs> sorry, we made a new we game." We went overboard. <laughs> we well, just decided at, we wanted with... to make a new game. <laughs> sorry. I mean, look at what they did with Monster Hunter Portable, the first one, right? Or Monster Hunter One. So they it took time to localize and bring it to the West, and in that time, they're like, "Oh yeah, we just added the dual blades." Whoops. Yes, that was. Uh, <laughs> it's just like that was Monster Hunter Freedom, right? It was not Freedom Unite. It was just Freedom, the, the oh, portable version. I, I will trip myself up on English names, so I don't know. Okay. But yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's there's history of just like, they pump in as much. They just want to put make as much as they can make. They, they, they love what they're doing. So do you want to go through the top 10 and, and I mean, talk I, if there's actually, any surprises I don't wanna, or feelings? Or? I, I don't want to go through the top 10. I want to go through the whole thing. I mean, not every single oh, monster, Jesus. but I want to go to the bottom of the list. To talk Before about we do that, though, can I want? I don't know if they showed this on the Western stream. I want to feel that they didn't, but maybe they did, and I'm wrong. But they had a graph where they showed the re the regional breakdown of the top three in the Japanese stream. The so, for example, if, they, if so, they have Japan, the Americas, both North and South, Europe, and Asia. And if you were only going to take did. the polls from those territories, there was a different order of the top three. No, I don't. I don't think they did. But let's let's. I don't circle. know why it's it's it's. But do you right. have it? Do you have that data there? Yeah, yeah, right in front of me right now. Okay, yeah. good. But let's circle to that when we get to the actual topic. Okay, okay. okay? So first, I got I gotta say, what what's wrong with Steel <laughs> Oregon? What's wrong? What game with was him? he in? I don't know. I I don't think I've ever even <laughs> fought him. But like the reason I'm asking is, it I'm must a, be a dull stain, right? I'm an Oregon fan, right? So I like Oregon. I know that a lot of people don't like him because he drops his little uh, pellets of poo oh, that fun. explode. But I like Oregon. I'm a big fan. I like the way that his armor looks. I like the fact that it comes with defensive. Uh, oh wow! So he was portable third only. Only I do portable not third. Ever Maybe I I played that once. Portable third. I went back on the Vita and played it, but. I don't remember him at all. I mean, I guess that shows how unmemorable he was or Damn. something. But people didn't like sheesh. Steel Oregon at all. Poor guy. I don't think that's people didn't like him. I think looking at that list, I was like, all these monsters are 
kick ass. Like they're really good. I think it's more of a, it's like a popularity contest on top of yeah. the popularity. You know, like all these monsters are loved. It's just who these is are more just memorable, not, right? These are just not very. Um, they're they're just not. They're also from some of the older games, like Portable Third. Very limited title, only in Japan. Yeah, like you people have to, like, like who only played you know one version of the game or two they wouldn't even know the monster so yeah if you want to play it in the west know you have that to world do like and... the the fan patch with the jail broken psps and all of that <laughs> stuff i because I, I know this because my friend did that stuff to his psp and i was like oh okay i, I don't want to have to go through all that trouble to play a game yeah. okay i hope they just so release guess, it here sometime. how do you we have 228 how do you want to go through these without Going through every single one five I mean, hours as I don't have five hours. No, we can go through them, but I mean, just like one comment for each. No, I mean, I, I, I don't want to go through all of them. That's the thing. I just want okay, to bring okay. out some of them. So I, I brought up Steel Oregon because he's the yeah. dead last. He that, is that was the, the least. Thing. And now he's going to be super popular. I guarantee exactly. because there's everybody loves called, an underdog. I don't know what the effect is called, but people like, yeah, love the underdog. Like that happens in Japan with some of the idol groups, like that do singing and performance on stage where. They'll have like handshake conventions where you can pay money to like say hi and get a single handshake from like the girl in the group that you really like. And of course, I don't know what they're going to do post COVID for doing that kind of stuff. But like, yeah. oh, am I allowed to say that word? Or is that going to get the podcast? I don't, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> but like, you know, there, there's always that one girl that not one person bought a ticket for and she's just sitting oh. there all sad and smiling. And all, and that gets around and all of a sudden she's got like, the biggest line at the next convention because people are like all of a sudden you're looking at the underdog and you're like oh yeah. i like this person or oh yeah so it's a good way to get attention so unfortunately steel Oregon is locked to portable third so there's no way that people are going to be able to play it so i don't see its popularity increasing yeah so at all when a drum being at the bottom made me laugh hard what what Eodrome was the the third to last <laughs> at number 227 He's just—he's just, he's just an annoying. He's, he's just an annoying, annoying little dude. Just jumps around, spits poison at you. That's it. That's his thing. Doesn't really. I do love much that else. Apex Arzuros was right behind him, and I think that's because that's post patch. Because when he first came out, like he had really bloated values, and he was a real bitch. I mean, um, I, and then they fixed him. I think Apex Arzuros is actually really fun because he has that move that. He, oh like, wait, no, I'm thinking Sunbreak. I'm not thinking Apex. Yeah. Yeah. I no, liked I, him a lot actually. He was really cool. Yeah. But one of the things that I liked seeing is that Aurora Somnicanth is in the bottom where it Why? belongs. Where Dude, it me belongs. and Yuna were like, what the hell? I hate Aurora it- Somnicanth. I think it's a terrible monster. I don't it's like a great it at monster. all. No, I it's like terrible. It I it's, like in my top, the- it's in my top 100. No, I like the fact that it's at the bottom, and I'll tell you what. I think Steel Ooh. Oregon is better than Aurora Somnicanth. Steel Oregon should have been on top. Justice for Steel Oregon. Man. <laughs> I see, like, I see I see Beotodos down here, and I'm like, that's an aim issue because that monster is freaking fun as hell once you, you know how to hit it right, and it's just flipping and flailing and jumping everywhere. It's yeah, fun. I, th- I thought it was pretty that, fun, But, too. you know, that's... That's people who just ran into Iceborne from World, thinking they're just they didn't have to upgrade their gear, and they got their asses their asses clapped, yeah. right? And they're like, uh oh. So it's, they is bad memories. Right bad memories from Beatotis is what uh, what yeah. people are getting. But like uh Yeah, so we have lots of subspecies and, and, and stuff like Red Helm Arzuros was basically the the framework for Apex for Arzuros, Apex right? Arzuros, Being able to yeah. close so much distance. I with, think it, I think the fact that he's higher up here is because he has the the cooler like uh, mohawk thing, which I kind of feel like Apex didn't have that, did he? Yeah, no, and yeah. he also had specific gear, which unfortunately yeah. Apexes did not. But but I I like Red, Magma Red Almadron. Better. Come on, that monster was the shit. I love Almadron eh, so much and to see it rank so was, low. He was all it right. Kills me. He was all right. But, I'm not uh, too big on him, but I think he was all right. How, I got to say, though, the most ridiculous thing is how Here. low Narwa is on this yeah, list. Yeah, I was. I knew I knew that was coming. What but in the listen, hell? You need, you need to remember one thing. They're, they have a distinction between Narwa and All Mother, which and is the what All you Mother. Liked. But Narwa was awesome. We, I, we love Narwa as well. I mean, I, I thought Naro was okay. I, I, I told you, if you remember when we were talking about Rise back in the day, I told you like... Lower than fighting- Ruby Basarios. <laughs> 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 okay. 
I was gonna I, say something, but like, when you say lower than Ruby Basarios? Lower than the Great Izuchi. Lower than a Crystal Beard Uragon. Hey, I like lower Crystal than, Beard. I like Crystal Beard. He's my boy. Listen, he had some really uh, high raw damage weapons in Gen U. There were some of the highest raw weapons. I remember grinding them. And, and I remember specifically because my, my friends, Wada and Kegrin, were the two people that I played GU with. Every time they were playing, I'm like, okay, boys, it's time to go grind okay. some more Crystal Beard. And they were like, no. Uh, yeah. I'll, give it, I'll give you that. But Ruby Basarios, I... Come on. I don't know. I only remember Ruby Basarios from, like, stories, too. I don't think I ever fought Ruby Basarios in some of the other games. So... I'm sure you've yeah. faced off against him in 4G or for Ultimate, right? With the uh, that's the he thing. He would appear a lot in the uh, the guild quest maps. That's the thing that I've always told you. I only played high rank in 4 Ultimate because I forgot it was... you always you always play games and you stop right before it gets delicious. No, no, that, that's not oh. the pro the problem. The problem with that one was it's the 3DS, dude. I can't I can't yeah, play it 3DS. It, it cramps me and there's a big screen in front of me. Like, come on. <laughs> Fair like enough, if fair if enough. they release that game on like a Switch or a PC, I'm gonna be so uh, goddamn hooked. I'm I'm playing it nonstop. That that's basically how it goes. But yeah, Narwhal was a little bit lower than I expected. Ibushi is also kind of like I remember it seeing it uh, a little bit. One eighty four. Yeah, one eighty four. Yeah. But yeah, you know he's a little bit be better. I mean Ibushi, I understand because he's he's a punching bag. Okay, I'll I'll give Unlike you this. Narwa. I'll give you this on on the account of Narwa. It's lower than Somnican? Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> See, now that, that is dirty. <laughs> that is very you, dirty. You know what I think? It, you know what? This is weird, but I think might be the issue is the All Mother took over people's memory. So they just look at it as a, yeah. a less interesting version. Also, I'm curious if people shared the sentiment I had at first, which was it was unsatisfying because you didn't get to kill it. When you fought it, it dropped some scales and then it ran off, right? You didn't get to finish the job, and there's something unsatisfying about that. Yeah, it's just a repel quest more so than anything, so it would make sense. But, like, the, the thing that I was telling you earlier, fighting both her and Ibushi with the gun lance in base rise, it was a miserable experience. <laughs> like it, was, it was not I did fun. get a reminder. <clears throat> I got a reminder on this list on just how... Few people actually played the Lance because any Lancer, I would imagine, it's in my top five for God's sake. The Glacial Agnactor. How is it only? It's 165. It's such a good monster. Come on. Mm. So the, the Abnaka monsters weren't very popular. I, I imagine that's because most people didn't get to that ridiculous rank to fight them. The the risen so the hard. risen monsters. Yeah, I still think that was a bad decision, uh, even to this day. To to make it that hard to get to them, to it unlock was, them. I, it I wasn't just... even. It wasn't even the, the the risen that were like the hardest ones. The hardest ones were like the EX versions of them, which I forget what they call them. The the ones that require three hundred, which I still haven't reached three hundred. I still need to go back and do that at some point. <clears throat> but I saw a, a monster in here that I I don't even know what monster hunter this is from. I think this might be from Dose, the Hypnocatrice. Or is oh, that frontier? the Hypnocatrice, yeah. It might be one or two, uh, but that was in the older games. That's the bird that would put you to sleep all the time. Yeah. I, I remember my friend would talk about the Hypnocatrice. So, yeah. We got some more stuff here uh, close to the bottom. Some risen White monsters. Monoblos being lower killed me. 147. Uh, yeah, White Monoblos you, is one of your favorite you ones. You know what's really upset? She told me if we do a podcast, I have to mention it. Okay. She was insulted that Zora Magnaros was 148. And I tried to remind her, I was like, that's halfway up the list. That's pretty, I mean, this is a popularity list of good monsters. Being that high yeah. is actually really good. She's like, you wouldn't have gotten to your favorite monsters in Monster Hunter World if it wasn't for Zora. So what the hell? Where's the disrespect coming from? Is what well, she says. Like, like I've always said, I think the biggest problem with Zora is the fact that they don't force you to actually engage in a fight. Because you can basically afk cannon blast zora into oblivion i mean i say afk but you get the point you just load the cannon shoot the cannons load the cannon and that's that whole fight 
But the interesting, and here's the thing, a lot of people still don't know that there's actually some really interesting mechanics to Zora Magdros. You can go up to his belly. Yeah. You can hit him in the belly. You can go up to his head after you've been teleported to the cannons and you can break the crystal on his head. There's so many things that you can do to Zora Magdros. The problem is you don't have to. Even yeah. in the, I think even in the hardest version, because they have like that, uh, what's it called? The arch-tempered version of Zora Magdros. Even in that version, you don't have to engage in those mechanics. So people didn't. They just fired the cannons and it is what it is. But yeah. yeah. Dude, Bum Bambaro is also very low. I would expect Bambaro yes. to be much higher. 156. Bambaro, I felt like, was a fan favorite. I love Bambaro. Oh, fun to sound, yeah. And Garen Golm. I think also I think it also low. comes down to equipment, right? Monster Hunter games are not just the monster, but their equipment, their theme song, their weapons, and I think the monsters in the top hundred, if you look at them, have really unique themes and, and armor that people actually use. Yeah. When you get the earlier monsters, it's harder because you don't necessarily use or farm them. So they may be monsters that you only faced every now and then. But like So I think the the true popularity, I think the list starts at one hundred. Like the top hundred. Yeah, but, but like reason. again, Ben Barrow and Garen Golm are just two monsters that I really wish were higher on the list. Uh Ben Barrow yeah. especially, because he was super fun. But when it comes to Sunbreak, Garen Golm was my favorite one of the three lords. Garen Golm. Especially if you mount Garen Golm, right? If you get the the Wyvern riding, his attack just goes like smash, smash, and you can just like do it three times in a <laughs> row. <laughs> it's so good. He will I love mess that. up the yeah, other monsters. Yeah. Like, each one of his attacks will be three hits, and I was like, smash! Garen Golm, smash! I love that. But yeah, we... I don't agree with them separating Atal Ka from Atal Naset, because Naset yeah, is not... Yeah, that was weird. It's, it's not, not a, a monster. monster. Yeah. It is literally just a load of junk that she's controlling, and when you knock her out of concentration, she drops the entire thing. I was like, very, why would you, that I was makes very no confused sense when I saw it on the list. I was like, I even started thinking, could there be that there's a special event quest where you only fight a ton no, of set? No, but because I don't think that's, that's her thing. thing. Yeah, that's just a thing that she uses. So, I mean, I think that's just weird. Yeah, that was a weird separation. I, I think it's because they named it and so they decided they would name it. I mean, does where, that mean that if Dalamadur's tail had a name that it would have been a separate monster? Like, I don't. Where is it on the list? Because I'm not seeing it. Yet. 95. Oh, wait. 95. You're, you're just like already way up in there. There's still stuff to talk about a little bit lower. Oh, sorry. No, I, no. I leave to you. So, so, so it's like. I'm only interested about talking about the top of the cream. <laughs> about the top of the cream? Okay. I mean, we'll, we'll get there soon enough. But, like, for instance, one of the things that I was surprised was Celtus Queen is extremely low at 104. Like, Celtus Queen is a That's really. That's not cool extremely part. low. That's really high. Are you kidding yeah, me? 104 I mean, out of 200 and some odd monsters out of the entire series having the guess, Celtus Queen, who's only been in a few titles? That's I, really high. That's I above Gold I'm, I'm just a little bit biased because, for starters, it has artillery gear. Not everything can be in the top 20. Yeah, but you know? huh? it's just, there's something so cool about the monster because, uh, I mean, obviously the gear's got artillery, which is really good for the weapons that I like. But on top of it, I love the concept of her having the Celtus pick her up and flying around yeah, and then yeah. dropping. Oh, and I love I, it. It's like so that's, cute. that stuff is awesome. Right. And by the way, which, which of the Celtus is the one that yeets, uh, I mean, which of the Celtus Queens is the one that yeets Celtus? Is it just Celtus queen? Cause yeah, one of them Celtus can, queen. one of them can yeet the Celtus, right? Like actually throw it against you and it'll die or something. Yeah. That's the queen, the, the crab looking one. I don't, I don't remember her doing that. I thought that might have been like a special variant that yeets him or something. The thing is, is it, it often kills the Celtus, which is hilarious. Yeah, exactly. They take your bait and just... <laughs> that's yeah, that's, that's why queen. I like it. Yeah, but uh, Anjanath being at 106, Anjanath was uh, one of the senseis of world, I would say. Kind of like in the same way yeah. that uh, Kutku and all of that. Where did, Where is young Kutku? Where did that bird fall? It's probably higher, I would imagine. Yeah, justice for young Kutku. Justice for young Kutku. <laughs> Oh yeah, here it is. It's on the Oh yeah, it's 35. It's yeah, way up there. Yeah, it's okay. way up there. That's fine. So and, and the world healed itself. Okay. Kuluyaku at number 88. I'm happy to see him this high because Kuluyaku, I love this. This, this little thing about just like picking up the herbivore eggs yeah, and yeah. like duk 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 duk. It's just like that. And we got that wonderful Japanese commercial for World, where Yamada-san was mimicking a Kuluyaku. Do you remember that one? He's like ah. He drops this big boulder, and his friends are like, "What the hell are you doing?" 
And then he jumps out oh, of the yeah, ground. Oh, yeah, remember- Diablos! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And on top of it, it's also the starting monster for the, the collaboration quest with Final Fantasy XIV. Final Fantasy XIV, yeah. Where you even get the Chocobo music. So it makes sense that he's this high. Kulu Yaku is... Uh, I find it interesting because apparently at some point I made like a tier list of monsters. And I... I said yeah. Kulu Yaku is an S tier monster, and a lot of people were fighting me on that. It's like, no, you're oh, wrong. He's great. Kulu Yaku is an S tier monster. I don't care what you say. You're wrong. I also think he. I also particularly like him because the way that he holds the boulder makes you actually think about positioning a little bit. Unless yeah. you're, you're, you're a boulder, unless you're, I guess you just hit the hit the face or something. But like, or a gun like there's like getting def- Whenever you get a thing like that where your your attacks are getting deflected and you have to think about how to approach it. And it does like lunging attacks. I love it, and it's all and the, built into the monster's ecology and what it does. It's it's cute. And the modification to his stun values as well. When he hits you with the rock, it's easier to stun you. Like there's there's a lot yeah. of nice details that I that I, I feel like Kuliaku is a little bit uh, because he's such an easy monster. A lot of people in the community don't appreciate the nuances yeah. that he brings to the table, which is really cool. Uh, Kurupek was a little bit low. But actually, no. I, I keep I keep thinking about that's it. That's high. Oh, that that is high. Kurupeku for a is monster high. that has not been in World or Iceborne or Rise or Sunbreak, it's been most of the people voting in this don't even know the damn monster, and it's this yeah. high. That's crazy. That's that just shows good. how much people remember it. Okay, but you have Crimson to agree. Fatalis at seventy-seven, like my favorite of the three Fatalises, just getting <laughs> massacred up here. You have to Compared you to have to give two. me you have to give me that Yan Garuga is low. Eighty three for Yan Garuga. That's lo- no, that's, I think it's. You think you think because you got to remember Yan Garuga pisses off a lot of people I because guess. it's really fast. Like that is a monster that if you go back to the older games and you try to heal, that thing will catch your ass and hit you and knock you out of it like in a second. That thing was so people are frustrated fast. at him. Is what you're I saying? I think there's trauma. Yeah, I think there's there's a bit of trauma because like Monoblos is also a really fast monster that when they tuned it, they made sure that when it knocked you over, when it charges you, no matter how far back it goes, if you try to drink a potion the second you you stand up, they're not giving you the window. It will hit you every time. Damn. And so they're teaching you, you have to dodge it again and think about when you're going to drink that damn potion. And most people can't do that. So I think there's an annoyance factor there. Okay. Garuga is, is awesome. And any Prowler player would be very proud to see any of the Garugas up there high because we farmed a living shit out of that monster. So Especially Deadeye. Oh, this, one, this one was surprising for me, mostly because I feel like this monster that I'm about to tell you has a very active, uh, loud minority of people that absolutely love this monster Zamtrios like every single oh, time this is amazing yeah, oh. but, but it's like there's so many people every single time that you're talking about a tier list everybody's like bring back Zamtrios justice for Zamtrios Zamtrios yeah. it's like I'm not saying he's bad I think Zamtrios is really fun he's really cool which is why I'm so surprised he's at 81 I expected him to be like at least top 50 Zamtrios oh, Jesus, at 81 man. was very surprising I think 81 me. is super tall I mean, but for I mean, Zamtrius, you gotta remember he—he's an amphibian, which is not a very represented type of monster in the game, right? You got yeah. Tetsukabra, and I actually—that's all you have, I think, is Tetsukabra and Zamtrios. It was—it was funny and, to me. Uh, oh, and Tetratronodon, hes also. Uh, it, it was funny to me because, like, my my friend Hengist, he doesn't like sharks, so whenever we would fight the Zamtrius, it was like, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like the Zamtrius. I, I, he looks like a I shark. Think what, I mean, I think 81 is stupidly high, especially when yeah. considering everyone else it beat out. But if if I were to make a guess on why it wasn't any higher, I would say that isn't there like um one obviously because it wasn't in like World Iceborne. I think that's always a huge deal on these lists. World, but also like I mean, World Iceborne. Isn't there like a Rice phobia? Sunbreak. You know how like the, they got like those phobias of like people who don't like you know how there's this things like with lots of little eyes and like it looks like a comb and people go, Ooh, they get freaked out by those types of patterns. Like, isn't there a phobia that some people have of, like, those really big, weird, gelatinous things going, like, blah, 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 blah. almost like a... I mean, maybe. He almost, I, he almost looks like a godskin brother, right? Like, he blows up all <laughs> gelatinous and big and, and rolls around at you. I don't know if people have a thing about that or not, but we have to give but a shout-out. I shout think out. that's a cool... I love him. We have to give a shout-out to the first monster ever made at number 78, the Rathian. Yep. 
Baratheon. She's on top of the logo. Hopefully now everybody knows that because they they mentioned it for the billionth, billionth time that yeah. that is not Rathalos on top of Monster Hunter 1. That is I Rathian. Probably, I probably thought it was Rathalos too the first couple of times I saw it. I wouldn't be surprised if I thought like like that. But uh, A lot of people, I think, think of them as separate monsters, but they are the same species. They're just the... Yeah, it's the male the, and female version. Just, yeah, male and female of them, so they are yeah. the loses. So... Nakarkos at 79. Nakarkos, I That's hope high. that someday make, makes a comeback, but it definitely shows that there's a lot of people that love this monster. It's Liked a it, really yeah. cool monster. So, yeah. Your boy, Crimson Fatalis, at 77, like you were saying. Yeah, Molten Tigrex, 75. That's also on my top oh, five that, of favorites. Is, isn't that your actual favorite, Molten Tigrex? No, Bloodbath Diablos is my number one. Ah, Molten was my, is my number two. Okay. Well, I, I adore that monster. Silver Lowe's coming in a little bit higher than Goldian. And then my favorite monster, number 73. I'm, I'm so disappointed. That's a respectable. That's it's a, so that's low, position. dude. It's so incredibly low. I was like, what? Come on. It's not... Hey, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm all I'm happy gonna at Multi My, my number two, getting up to 75, and you're lamenting your monsters at 73. Like, no, oh. it needs to be. I'm, I'm weaponizing my audience next time. I'm going to force force my boy up the list. Can't believe this insult. Where Where is Basil, though? Where is, where is, oh, Basil's wait, wait, at 52. We'll, we'll talk about Basil. We'll talk about Basil. Take it easy. But yeah, we got... Seething uh, has the, the rave colors. I love it. Like yeah, the, see, see, Seething is really cool. We have Risen Shigaru, Devils, Toby Kodachi. Toby Kodachi was an amazing I really monster. liked Risen Shigaru. I just wish more people got to face it. I really yeah. enjoyed that fight. So, a big surprise for me. Great Jaggy was higher than Hell yeah. Fossil Ghost. <laughs> it was like Great hey. Jaggy. I love Great, great Jaggy. He's Jaggy the first Harkless. monster I ever fought. He's the first monster yeah, I ever it's fought. The, it's, the, it's the sensei monster for a lot of third fleeters out there go, 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 go. calls in his little jaggies to come help him yep. <laughs> okay see Deus, dread king uh puke sha camellios lao shan lung this i feel like is is kind of like a, a rite of passage for a lot of hunters the lao shan lung hunt yeah i mean this is this is just showing how many you know monster Hunter freedom unite players were participating in this poll because that was such a memorable thing for yeah that generation Thunderlord Zenogre also very high because the well anything Zenogre right yeah any anything Zenogre goes up there Lucent Nargi coming in at fifty four as well yeah. Balzac Maggie Yamatsukami I never fought this one you told yeah. me the fight is actually not that memorable if I remember uh, correctly I mean it's memorable in the fact that it's such visually bizarre from what you're used to like yeah. and it, it looks so different but like the actual mechanics of the fight I find pretty boring. I mean, it's got like that Osmos. I, I I hate that I'm putting everything into FF14 terms, but <laughs> it's got like the it's got like the black hole <sighs> suck you up, and you got to find a way to dodge it. And it's got like a really annoying helicopter wing hit attack that you have to dodge. But I don't know. I didn't fight. I don't find the fight as interesting as I do the monster itself. I think I think a lot of people like Yamatsukami because of the whole um, Cthulhu themes and whatnot. He's an octopus, uh, yeah, yeah. all of that stuff. That's probably why. So. An interesting thing about Basil Goose that was pointed out to me in my stream, because I didn't immediately make the association. He's number 52 because he's the B-52 bomber. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what does this say? Na nature just writes poetry itself, yeah, exactly. right? exactly. Just... <laughs> I thought that was really funny when people were like, well, he's the 52 because he's the fi two B-52 bomber. I was like, oh, damn, that actually, that's actually so memeable that I actually like the fact that he's number 52. But I did expect him to be a little bit higher, but, you know, it is what it is. People like what they like. Soul Seer Mizutsune being up there as well. A lot of people like yeah. good old Doggo. The Cantor Zeno at uh, 43. Savage Joe at 42. You know, a couple of... Joe only at 40. That's surprising. I figured there'd be more people rooting for the pickle. It's number 40 on the list of... I, am, I hate to sound like a broken record. That's really yeah, damn yeah. high. It's, That's it's, top it's 50 really of high. monsters of all time. But for Devil Joe, I expected him to potentially be featured in the top 10. So that was kind of like something that surprised mm. me. But you have your boy Bloodbath Diablo. Where's Diablos Savage Devil Joe, though? He's, he's, he's on my He's lower at 40, oh, 42. He's at 42. Ooh, yeah. that's just trauma. People, people need to get good. They're just traumatized <laughs> by it. 
But then again, he was actually a disappointment for me in World Iceborne because I I think he was too easy. Like compared to how Savage he was in Joe? fourth gen, like oh yeah, Savage Joe yeah. in fourth gen was way more scary. Oh yeah, get like up on those hind legs, scare the shit out of you. You'd run out to the next map and pray that he wasn't anywhere near that entrance when you went back in there. In in Gen U, I remember when I was fighting him in G rank with my friends. Like bro, the, the, every, oh, he is every time. Yeah, he was oof. But yeah, we got Doggo at forty one. Forty one, okay. Hellblade Hellblade yeah. Glavinus being higher than Devil Joe was surprising to me. I did not realize Glavinus was that popular. Like I'm happy because you know, it just goes to show that Glavinus is clearly better than Mizu. You know? I don't I you know what <laughs> well, you, how much did no, Eric's pay you to say that? No, I'm wrong. You know why Mizu, this is Mizu though? is actually fourteen, so <laughs> No, I, I have I have a guess on why this is so high. It's because Hellblade Glavinus, at least here in Japan, it became the the de facto speedrun monster in Monster Hunter oh. Generations Ultimate. Okay. Almost all speedruns, because it was like the one fight that was a set arena, set monster, set health was its... Uh, it's the final one that you do against the Deviant, the... Uh, what is it? The EX. EX. Or the, 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 the whatever. EX. The yeah. EX. So the EX became like the staple for speedruns. And so you'll see almost all the Japanese speedruns are against Hellblade. And so yeah. I think, and its gear was just damn good. So, uh, yeah, I, I remember I used, so um, I used this, um, his sword and shield. No, actually, I, not only his sword and shield, I was both his sword and shield and his gun lance because I like blast and he had a ton of blast and it was just like good stuff. Even though I don't think that his gun lance was max shelling. I don't remember, but I, I remember I, I used this right, quite a 20, bit. 25 for Glavinus, 14 for Mizutsune. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty official now. Yeah, 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 Who's yeah. Who's the yeah. better monster? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now, an interesting... Uh, where's, the, where's the acidic Glavinus on this list? I mean, who cares about acidic Glavinus? Not even I like the acidic Glavinus, but he's very low. I remember 136. that he's kind of... 136. He's at 136? So, yeah, so he's hang on, so I'm curious. I, I'm curious how much the collective score... Of the Mizutsune's versus okay, the collective okay, score bro, of okay, the rankings <laughs> Okay, okay, <laughs> Gaijin, chill. All right? <laughs> no, but what, I mean, one of, one of the 63, things... 48, and ah, Apex is pretty low, though. 163, that hurts. One of the things that I want to point out that I think just really showcases, because, like, you and I have talked about this monster a lot. We've seen this monster's praise a lot. Atal Ka. We always talk about Atal Ka oh, as one of our Atal favorite Ka. monsters. It's number mm -hmm. 34. It 34. was featured in literally one game. One game. One game, and he makes it all the way on top of Devil Joe. On top of Devil Joe, okay? That, that I think is not But he doesn't beat, well, she. She doesn't even beat Kezu, though. But that's okay, because it's Kezu. <laughs> I mean, but Kezu is Kezu. Kezu, <laughs> Kezu but, has I mean, the best theme, so, I mean, you can't you yeah, can't the, really tango with Kezu. Yeah, I talk, uh, my God. God, what a memorable fight. And the music is just so, so damn good. good. Yeah. At Atal Kai is amazing. Oh, I, I really miss. I still always remember the detail of the animations of how when Atal Kai grabs the, um, that little big yeah, Ferris wheel threads. and starts like oh, eating yeah, yeah. it around. And the wheel actually looks believable in the way that it animates. And I was like, God, how did they do this back in the day? It's insane. It's very they well done. They need to bring Atal Kai yeah. back. So we got Chaotic Gormagala at 27, uh, Gogmazios at 28. I still never fought Gogmazios. Nice. I got to do it at some point. Oh, I'm so happy Hey J finally got to fight him and, and, yeah. and love him. He's kind of love. You know, you I'm, I'm breaking order. You know, I'll yeah. just talk about it later. But one of my okay. favorite memories is actually has to do with Gogmazio. So we'll talk about that we'll, later. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But yeah, so you got yeah. Furious Rajang, 24. Bolt Reaver Astalos is really high. That was not something that i was yeah. expecting i will i'll give another tinfoil hat this was the de facto speed run monster for prowlers in gu oh i i thought it was just it was because a, he had a big laser sword and people like hell yeah yeah dude, he's a, je he's a, he's a jedi right <laughs> he's yeah a, he's got a light i think the, col the colors are just too damn cool yeah the, they are they're freaking awesome yeah, we got when, Raging Raging yeah. Brocky at 22 as well, which is really good. It wouldn't even have been up there if it wasn't for Iceborne, because Iceborne's interpretation of that monster was yes. so good. Yes, 100%. Compared like, to what? If, for if you, it, it would have been in the hundreds. 
Yeah, if if it was just for you and Genu, Raging Brocky was actually not that amazing. It, as a matter of fact, it was just more of an annoying fight than anything. It's not even hard. It's just annoying because it just kind of box you, and he's huge, and he just kind of like jumps yeah. around, then punches you in Comically the face, and runs. jumps around. But and you're like, I can't even hit you because you're so big. <laughs> it's like you know, because all you have to hit is his tiny little legs, and he keeps moving away. And then because yeah. he's like hunched down, his belly pushes you out of the way as he moves. And like, I can't hit. It's almost like he's holding you down. Like, you know, like you're a little yeah. child and he's just like a massive dude puts his hand on your head and you're just, let me hit you. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like how it feels to fight old school raging Brocky Dios. It's the school bully I... holding you by the head. <laughs> oh, God. That's a good example. Yeah. But like, so we have I love that the, uh, I love poster boy. Is it not even in the top Not 20? even in the Get top bugged. 20. Get uh, what? Dude. What, I, what dude, I love that. I, they need to retire his ass for a game. A game. I hate the no. idea that like, He's Pikachu the has to be in every damn game. He's the, like, come on. Like, listen, Gaijin, I got Give bad him news. time to cook. Let him come not, back better than ever. I'm not sure if you've watched the Monster Hunter Wilds trailer. <laughs> I know. Rathalos is in it. <laughs> yeah, they showed you know they showed us a, a small monster that was insignificant. <laughs> Fine, Just, the Rathalos. Look, I love hate Rathalos, them. but when you play the franchise as much as most of us do, do you not get sick of that? No, monster? I don't like, get tired like, of Rathalos. Like, give it a I break. Don't. Like, no, I'm, I don't. I don't really? get tired of it. I love fighting. It's it's, what, it's okay. the same thing. What's your favorite iteration of it to fight? Not for design, but to fight. Uh, which game do you enjoy it the most? Because it does change quite a bit throughout the series, so. I mean, the thing is, I love the fact that they added new moves to him in, was it Rise or Sunbreak that they added the new moves? I forget. I think it was Sunbreak, they right? Add, they added they his, um, stuff to him all the his time. breath that he does, and he goes like, <laughs> and then it shoots out a breath. Oh, all it's the, the Savage Devil Joe, uh, sort of like, oof, I'm beautiful, fling my hair in the sky kind of like move. I'm fabulous. I mean, I, I don't know if I'd call it that, but yeah, that that is new breath move. Like I like Ooh. that. So, I guess probably the sunbreak version. But then again, one of the things that I've realized about myself is I have a really bad case of recency bias. Like I always, uh, I'm always very biased to recent things. So I'm probably, probably the opposite. One. I have like nostalgic bias, but my favorite iteration of him is three ultimate because Why? there was one move that he would do. That was so iconic and would freaking kill you almost every time. And you actually had to play around it and th and think about it the entire time and look at his motions like, is he about to do a roar and then a back step fireball in my face? Because if you did not have HQ air plugs on, you were screwed if you were in front of him when he did that move, because that fireball pretty much killed you every time. See, I've so, always... like at least from when how I played it, you had to be careful not to be in that zone at all. But then again, I was playing Lance, so that might have influenced it. But, yeah. like, I thought that was so cool. See, that's that's the thing. I've always said the scariest thing that a monster can do to me in Monster Hunter is step back. That's the scariest <laughs> thing. Like, that scares me. Cause, especially because I'm always, like, gung-ho, hitting him with everything. So the moment I do a move and it doesn't connect and he steps back, I'm like, oh, no. What's what's coming next? So that's the scariest thing is when a monster steps back. But yeah, we've made it all, right, all the let, way to the the top twenty. So yeah, let's let let's go through. We'll all try to of go these. through them relatively fast, but let's yeah. go through them. Yeah, Crimson, Crimson Glow, Glow Vol Strax. Hell yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. It was actually the when monster... people say that the sequel can't be better than the original. This is the prime example of being wrong. I think it. Yeah. it's everything about the first monster, but but better. I actually met. This was the monster that I mentioned in. You the, met him. Met him? No. <laughs> it sounded like you said that's. This is the monster I met. I'm like, oh what? yeah, I met him. I shook his hand, <laughs> and then he blasted me with a laser <laughs> to the face, and I died. It was not a good experience. No, I, I was saying this was the one that I mentioned in the the panel that we had. Like people were talking about some of the most memorable things. And I was like, yeah, again, blast in the face by crimson, crimson glow Volstrax's uh, laser blast. Uh, Shigaru showing up at 19. Yeah. I think it's well earned. Shigaru is a really cool monster. Oh, yeah. You know, the evolution of uh, Gormagal. I'm actually surprised it a, that Chaotic... It had a story behind it, you know? 
I'm actually surprised that Chaotic is all the way at 27. I figured that would be even more preferable because of all of the rage implications and all that stuff, but eh, it's whatever. Namiel, what do you think about Namiel? Number seven. I was surprised uh, to see it 18. get that high. I I like the monster a lot, and I think it's I think it's just how unique it was, right? You look at this top 20, and what I see is like, what's the right word? Um, oh, God, why is the name not coming up? It's like RGB stuff for like keyboards. It's like it's really colorful, interesting palette monsters, and I think Namiel hits that. It's yeah, it's just visually cool, and I think it was it it deserved more love. But I was really surprised to see it way up this high. I if I wanted to be tinfoil hat, I would say, hey, its armor looked like Splatoon. Maybe that helped it become more popular. I don't know. No, um, no, no. Because like, listen, but uh, is, Splatoon, I'm just Splatoon is much more popular in Japan than it is in the West. Yeah. Like Splatoon is not. Yes, I don't know why it's as high. Yeah. I like, actually I, don't know why, but I, I just think it's a really cool I'll, monster, and you, the the combination of having two elements really made it special with yeah. the water and the lightning, and just the sounds that it does with the cracking when it lands that special lightning attack. I, I don't know. There's there's something really cool about it, so I was super happy to see it up there. On oh, yeah. seventeen, we have Brocky Boy Slime. Yeah. The slime. El I actually preferred slime over blast. I wish they'd bring back slime. Just thematically, I like slime more than blast, but I guess it's too late. Yeah, that's another monster I've talked in length about how I preferred it in the third generation, just because of the limited mobility you had, and it was so much more agile back then that it was really hard to navigate its pivoting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that double bracky quest nearly broke me on G2. Oh, my God. Dude, I remember doing... I, I timed out the double bracky quest in Generations Ultimate. There was like a double I had no one to play on. There was no online on the 3DS, and there was nobody around me playing that game, so I had to do it alone. I was I was on difficulty tuned. I was on vacation, and I didn't have uh, internet, so I was like, "Oh, I don't have my mm. friends to play with." So I'm doing the two Brocky quests on GU, and I was like, "Nope, timed it out. 15 minutes, it's gone." As a matter of fact, it wasn't that's even like I, that's one... when I fell in love with Hunting Horn, actually. It wasn't even like one session because I was like, I was midway through the fight and then I paused it, turned off the, not turned off, but like put it on standby, came back to it later and then I lost it. <laughs> 50 minutes wasted. Yeah. This might be breaking the rules. This might be a memory, but Bracadillo stands out because it's the monster that forced me to use a, a, a more than one weapon. Because up until mm -hmm. that point, I had only been using the Lance and he was notoriously hard to Lance in three ultimate because the Lance, he would punch you and just take all your stamina with him. And so when he did multiple hits to you, you just couldn't, you couldn't guard and counter him. There was just too many explosives. And so I had a really, really hard time countering him. It was just a really bad match for me. And that's what got me into Sword and Shield, which I fell in love with. And then when I found Hunting Horn and realized that it was designed so that the head of the horn was exactly where his chin was. And that when I swing it like a golf club, it knocks him upside the head and knocks him out in the most satisfying way ever. So he like flies over with like the dramatics of Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, like oh, you know, falls hey, why, over. It's, why you gotta, so why you gotta bring up Cristiano, <laughs> dude? Come on now, <laughs> that's just not fair. <laughs> hey, he deserves a Grammy for some of those dives. He's an awesome, he's, he, but he's awesome, anyways. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, Bracky's a good boy. Bracky's awesome. So Safi coming in at sixteen. Uh, did you do yeah. a lot of Safis when this came out, or? Because I remember when you it came were... out, no. But when yeah. when I went and played it with you know, we did a bunch of savvies, Yeah, how'd you we guys had like fun it? Just trying to. Well, we were constantly getting in battles over aggro. Like we'd constantly get up on his face and shoot it with slinger and steal the aggro from each other. And that was like our meta game during the entire fight. Was did you did you two man it or did you go to lobbies? Uh, we were playing with some friends on Xbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that would make sense. Because, like, trying to two-man that thing would be absolutely insane. They required too much uh, dedication. Yeah, we did it, but it was... Ugh. Yeah, I don't recommend yeah, it's, it. Yeah, it's, it's not a good thing. It was, it was actually um, funny because the way that you would organize lobbies when this came out, it'd be like, okay, we need a, a person with a bow gun for the wings. We need a person with this for something else. Like, you had all of these different strategies that, that we would do. Usually, I would be tanking with Gunlands. So I would be constantly taking aggro and just tanking it because I could 
um, shell any part of his body and still get max damage, whereas other people would have to go to specific parts to get their max damage. So I would always try to tank with Gunlands. Oh, hang on. I, I forgot to do a shout-out because I was told okay. I had to do a shout-out if we were talking about it from Yuna. She said she her favorite monster was... Where is it? Number 43, and she was pissed that it was not in the top Zeno Jiva is her favorite monster of all time? Yep. Interesting. I mean, if it wasn't for Zeno Jiva, I don't know if she would have been as addicted as she was and got fell in love with it as hard as she That was like the one that got her... That was the monster after before Naro that you know she fought hundreds and hundreds of times just for the hell of it because it was fun. Interesting, because I never found it. And I told her a lot of people don't like that. Yeah, most people yeah. don't like that monster, but she loves it. She's like, it's my baby, and she draws it with a little goo goo in its mouth. Like, what's this uh, is a baby wyvern? <laughs> what weapon was she playing when she fought Zenojiva? I can't remember. She's played so many different weapons. I I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, because, like, I'll, I'll tell you what. I was playing Sword and Shield when I fought Zeno I don't know. <laughs> yeah, with Insect Glaive, it's a really fun fight. Yeah, sure. I love fighting Zeno with Insect Glaive, but when I first fought Zeno I had Sword and Shield, and I was like, this is miserable. <laughs> I hate this fight. I don't like it at all. <laughs> Wait, yeah. why does it say Old Fatalis? That's a mistake. That's a typo. Isn't it White Fatalis, I thought? Yeah, why did they call it Old Fatalis? That's, that's a I mistake. I don't know. I don't know. The, I mean, the, he the, is old. He is. He's an old man. It's it's a reference to me because I'm old Fatalis. <laughs> What's well, a reference to the uh, Japanese name, which is like the ancestral Fatalis? Ancestral Fatalis. Or I mean, something like that. Yeah. What if, what if? Think about this. What if the reason Grandpa, they're re no? What if the reason they're rebranding him is to get people ready because he's going to be featured in Monster Hunter Wilds. Oh, I'm sure he will. Why? I'm sure he won't. Environmental changes, him and Crimson are perfect for that kind of stuff, especially him with his lightning coming down from above and the theme of lightning being shown off in the reveal trailer. It would not surprise me there to see go. him make a debut, yeah. See, guys, old Fatalis confirmed, going to be at Wilds 100%, <laughs> world exclusive, world premiere and I wanna, exclusive I, they, they on the have Third Fleet Podcast. Hell of a, they would... <laughs> If I were them, I'd be terrified now of ever featuring any of the other two Fatalis because they went so hard and they nailed the original Fatalis yep. so well in Iceborne. How the hell do you match or beat that? I don't know. But they have a... The expectations will be off the, the roof like when it comes to that type of stuff. But I hope they do. Yep. I, th I think it'll be interesting. But I do, I do think that if they're rebranding him, it could potentially be because they're getting him ready for another game so your, your boy mizu there you go your boy mizu is there on number 14 above glavinous are you happy you, you, i will give you guys a dirty secret just because you are listeners to the podcast but uh oh the four main monsters of 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 Gen U, right yeah i love them all we the know for i talk yeah. shit about glavinous because it's fun it's it's shit flinging about your favorites with your friends of course but when it comes down to it, I actually listen to the Glavinus theme song more than the other <laughs> one. And I actually, and I also, the song that, that gets me the most moved is Gameth. Uh, Gam Gameth, is that the name in English? Gameth, yeah. Gameth. Okay. Gam Gamuto. Gamuto. I love those. Um, and I actually think that they teased unintentionally. The idea that they might be bringing Gameth back. Why? Because they were talking in they were talking in the twentieth thing about all their favorite monsters and things that they did, and they were talking about Gameth, and they were like, "Yeah, he's just the problem with him is he's too big. Like they made him too tall, and so that there's collision issues all over the place. They can't find a way to get him brought. They're like, we brought back all the other." you know, main flagships from that title, but we never got to bring him back because he's too big. And they're like, I don't know, maybe we'll find a way to do it. Like, we'll have a baby gameth or something that's smaller. I'm like, oh, he's bringing up solutions. Bring uh -oh. up a subspecies that's just naturally smaller. Boom. Smaller it's in the next gameth. game. Smaller mm -hmm. Yeah. Potentially. I like, I hope so. But I love all the, the monsters. But Mizutsune is why we fell in love with that demo for Rise, was just beating the living hell out of Mizutsune. I I like the the bubble effect. I like the animations of 
<laughs> it's like almost, almost falling down. I love that, and I and I like what they did with uh, with Rise of actually making that a good thing. So you have like the that skill that if you're bubbled up, you're you actually have advantages. I thought that was neat to transform that that thing um, that way. So on number thirteen, Primordial Malzino, and this is one of the things that I instantly mentioned. This just goes to show you, despite all of the online discourse of people being like "rise bad, world good," there's actually a ton of people Sunbreak that is love. Way up there that love Rise and Sunbreak, 100%. Oh, yeah. There's just a lot of people that don't even want to engage in this stupid discourse of like, oh, my game's better, my game's better. Doesn't matter. They're both great. They're both fantastic. It's that simple, yeah. and that's the I, only answer. Primordial was super fun, and the, the teleportation was. and everything and the theme song, everything just came together so well. And I think if you look at this list, if you're looking at the same one I am, which I think I am because you gave me the link, Yeah. I think this whole row of 9 through 13... I would define it as edgy. Edgy wins. People like edgy shit. When a concept takes the original monster, instead of changing it, it just turns it up like hardcore. I think people really like that. So we get like, you know, Malzino is not a pure departure from what Malzino was. It's just, it's a more perfect version of it. It's just yeah. crazy. And the next one. Oh, I was so, so happy. So I've, ne I've never fought this one. Abyssal Lagi. God damn Okay, I know. you know what? I'm missing we'll just, out. We'll just have to say until you fight him, we will not do another podcast. You can't, you can't. You can't. You can't do can't that. Can't do that. No, can't. Oh come on! Because, so like, listen, good. listen, Gaijin, we have God, Rise you're of missing Ro out. Listen, Rise of Ronin, uh, Dragon's Dogma Two. I still haven't played Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. There's another game coming out that mm. I want to play, No Rest for the Wicked. There's the Elden Ring DLC. There's Stellar Blade. Like, I don't know when I'm going to have time to do anything. I wish I did. There's too many games I coming love. out. I love. The Abyss... Okay, so I'll tell you, the Abyssal Laggy was so memorable because in the game when you fight it, it's like the, the final, final boss pretty much of, of 3 Ultimate. And when you fight it, you're not just going into the sea like you normally do with the normal laggy, right? You're going into the deep sea. Like, it's dark, it's dangerous, you're, like, going way down into the depths. To the point that you're almost like, how the hell am I going to breathe down here? So, like, understanding where the water bubbles were was really important. And this, it was really dark. And this thing did, like, all these tornadoes. Think, like, Kushala Daora level. And it had this crazy, like... Bolt Reaver Acelos, right? It's the black and that sort of like high contrast turquoise blue, like really interesting color palette. And it was so deep and evil and just captured the theme perfectly. And it was so dangerous. And this was right after you got to fight Dire Morales as well. So you had like the really bright fire weapons versus it because that was like the counter. So oh. you, not only did you have this great fight against Dire Morales to get your, your stupid fire weapons. You then had to go down to the depths of the ocean and fight this thing. And it was so visually striking that I just, yeah, there's there's something really special just, about this fight. It just reinforces that we need an HD collection ASAP. It needs to happen. Yeah. Capcom, get on it. And, I, you know, I mean, ivory laggy fans, I mean, I love the monster as well, but I mean, a ivory laggy that doesn't land, leave the water. It was land only, right? Yeah. What do you and mean then you doesn't leave the do water? It doesn't go in the water. Like, like a bit, well, no, doesn't it? Isn't isn't ivory the one that oh, you find land on only? land? I, th I think ivory was the land one. Okay. I'm not sure. Maybe I got the image that it was primarily on land, but it could also or does also go it, in the it water. Might, but it might go like, in the water, but it was mostly on land, I think. Mm. Ivory. But Abyssal is like, that's something that you have to go to the depths of the ocean to fight. Like, you're, it's do or die. Like, you're, you're yeah. not coming out of that thing alive. Like, you travel to the, the, the point of no return, right? And you get to fight it. And there's... God. I love it. La Lagi, so Lagi and it had the best two... hunting horn as well. Like the design, yeah. the sound, the effects, everything was perfect. Lagi took two of the spots in the top 20 as well, which is very impressive. Then we have oh, yeah. um, Stygians and Ogre. I like him. St Stygians and Ogre was cool. Uh, the first time I fought him was actually Iceborne. And then I fought him again. Yeah. I think uh, Genu. Is he in Genu? I think he's in Genu, right? Yeah, I fought him there as well. He's cool. Elatreon fantastic but only the Hells, world version yeah. like i don't want no well, only no the world version yeah I, I don't like the other ones i mean i love him in the older games but the iceborne version is so incredibly good yeah ice iceborne version is but... way way better than the old ones in my opinion because i just feel like in the at, at least in gen u 
he was constantly flying. Like that was his thing. It's like I'm gonna fly here, fly there, fly, and it's like, bro. Well, that's what that's why I kind of liked was the idea is that back then it's like, if you want anything good from that fight, you gotta break its horns, but they were yeah. so damn hard to break, and you're like you'd you only had these little small openings where because he's so high up, where he brings his head down to do swipe attacks or to do a spell. And you had to find those windows, and it was very dangerous because there was AOEs going off, and then you had to smack it. So when you broke those horns, that was a true achievement. I remember and to have those so predominantly in the design of the weapons. It's like this is a trophy. Like that felt so good. I remember when I was playing with my friends, uh, I was constantly trying to nail them with the double A flare. I would run up to him, it's like, bam, bam, <laughs> to try and bring him. And every time I would bring him down with a double A flare, I was like, yes, got him. <laughs> it was really good. But yeah, that's Altreon. Ruiner, obviously. I, I was actually surprised that Ruiner was this high. Because, like, I thought Ruiner was really cool, but I guess people really, really liked Ruiner. You needed, like, yeah. Master I mean, Rank there's 100. There's not a huge to, difference. Like, was it 100 or to 200 me, to get this one? 100, 100, 100. 100. Okay. I think that he is similar to Primordial Malzeno in that they're just the, the edgy the, versions. Yeah. The edgy version of what they represent. And I think you know there was the story implications with Ruiner and Ergigante. It's got a really badass name in mm -hmm. uh, at least the Asian territories. Uh, much more badass than just Ruiner. Like it's it's a really long, almost ancient. It's it's, it's a cool name. Um, it's 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 special. So no surprises, honestly. But this high, yeah, a little surprising because you would think that did everybody actually get to face him or not? Yeah, is the question, right? Exactly. So that's but he never I be. I mean, I think also he's got that satisfaction thing, right? I, I, I think he's probably my most fought monster in Iceborne, because I would test all my sets against him. Because it was like the, the same idea behind the, Hellblade Glavinus is that, it was like the the litmus test. Okay, does this set work? It's a set arena, a set monster. I know the time in which I normally kill him. I know all the tricks of the trade and how to abuse the stage. I remember how is this set right and every it's just fun to break him right he constantly had stuff breaking off and falling over and then he got really aggressive in the last like 20 percent or whatever i remember that That's before cool. we met you made a video of you fighting him with uh, a slap lance from fatalis because said oh i saw work <laughs> on fight fight with this slap lance thing i wanted to test it out and i was like oh damn guy just split my weapon <laughs> <laughs> Slap Lance against him was super fun. It was. It was so good. But yeah, it's too bad that it was sl it was just Slap Lance, though. I, I want to see more shelling. Less slapping, yeah. more shelling. But okay, number eight, we have Fatalis. See, I expected him to be a little bit higher because that fight was so good. Uh, yeah, I, I think he's only not that high because the other ones are just so much bigger than life. I, I don't yeah. think it's anything against him. But yeah, but uh, the that Fatalis... And his fight sucked in the previous games. I hated it. It was boring. Oh, yeah, and, and the, in the previous games... In the previous I, games, I've, ugh. I've said it multiple times. In the previous games, it was not that great. And the interesting thing was when Fatalis came out, I actually did, um, I did a thing with my friends where we fought one of the old Fatalises from Gen U at the beginning of the stream. So the stream just starts, and we're fighting Fatalis... But it's the old one, and everybody in chat is confused, like, what's going on? And we're not saying anything, we're just fighting Fatalis. And I was like, okay, guys, we beat Fatalis, there you go. <laughs> That's all it is. The thing about old Fatalis, too, for the people that didn't fight the old ones, it was like, listen, here's all the depth of old Fatalis, okay? You get Mind's Eye, and that's it. That's it. Because yeah. your, your weapons bounce a lot. So you get Mind's Eye, you don't yeah. bounce anymore, you go kill Fatalis. It's the Mind's Eye tutorial monster, yeah. Yeah, that, that And was it had those like ridiculous values that if it just touched you with its toenail, you died. Yeah. So it was like, ugh. There's that too. Hit really hard. But yeah, that was old school Fatalis. It was not really that hard, to be honest. But the new one, I really appreciated all of the stuff that they did for him. And the fact that it wasn't even a planned monster. Like, for people that don't know, they did not plan on making Fatalis. It was mostly because they made, like, uh, some celebratory thing. Was it the 15th anniversary, I imagine? Probably? Where they Thanks showcased so, yeah. him? They showcased him on the 15th anniversary uh, wallpaper. And everybody was thinking, like, Fatalis is coming back! Yes, let's go! And Capcom was like, well, 
I guess we'll make Fatalis then. <laughs> and they just made it. And it was one of the coolest fights in that game. So, yeah. But number you know seven. I actually, go I'm, I'm going to. I have to mention it because I think I've always felt this about not just Monster Hunter, but everything in general. And it's a common belief, so it's nothing special. But I think restriction really is what breeds creativity. Like you look at all the games, like like Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, right? One of the, yeah. I, you know, arguably one of the greatest. Got a lot of people. And most of the stuff in there, like even Nargakuga, were things they had very little time to make. And so they had to get creative really fast, either it's because of time restrictions or technical restrictions or whatever. But I think it's it's the restrictions that really, really come out with some of the best ideas. I don't know. It's just when you give people unlimited resources and years and years to work on it, it just doesn't come out as special for some reason, I think. Yeah. Not to say that, you know, I don't know. I just think that it might be. It's a weird just... it's a weird thing because you need to strike a balance with that stuff because otherwise you end up with crunch culture and all of that so it's kind of yeah. dangerous but I understand exactly what you're saying. Sometimes pressure does make diamonds. Sometimes it doesn't do. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, sometimes it just kills people. In this in this case it made diamonds and it was pretty friggin' awesome. But yeah. So at number 7, Nargakuga, big fan favorite. Yep. People love Nargakuga and uh yeah makes sense pretty awesome monster don't really have much to add to that i'm not like yeah. the biggest nargakuga fan but i think he's pretty cool yeah it's the evasion tutorial monster yeah i love it Valkana coming in at number six i thought it was uh, yeah. higher than i expected it, although it was the flagship of iceborne so i guess it's expected to yeah. be really high up there so yeah you know seeing footage of Valkana and just like iceborne in general being showed again i'm like my God, that game was pretty. Yeah, it was. I, it is. I really hope. Still I, is. I hope that I know. I hope Wilds can get closer to that. I know they're doing more on screen, but there's something about that fidelity, man. Oh my God, I just get awestruck when I see that stuff. The so game pretty. was the game was freaking awesome. So and yeah. I love when we were at the we were at the concert and they had um, the composer on stage and she was talking about, you know, how she created the theme songs for them and how she created the theme song for Valkana and it was supposed to be uh, the, 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 the answer to Nergigante being the king they were to make the queen mm -hmm. but they wanted to have it to also be really strong with the trumpets and horns and, and everything and she was talking about it and you know, it was really fun it was, it was I have fond memories of Valkana I, I, I particularly remember thinking that it was kind of uh, an interesting mechanic that they introduced with her actually creating physical obstacles in the arena with the ice. Because that's yeah. one of those things that a lot of video games don't do that. It's like, oh, it's an ice attack and you get a little bit of a special flair. But the the reality is that ice does form solid structures. So them introducing that into it was both sometimes it messed up your attacks and other times it allowed you to do aerial attacks. So th there's a depth hey, to it. Hey, as an inside Glaive really user, I had no complaints. I was <laughs> just like, look at all this art that's going on below me. This is nice. Oh, yeah. I, c I can look at all this, these AoEs and things all the way safe up here. But yeah, number five, Gore Magala making it to the top five. Not really that surprising. It's an amazing monster. It was real, really cool. Yeah, they mentioned it in the video as well that it, it particularly is really, really popular in the West. Yeah, it is. Um, I think it's super popular here in Japan as well, but like especially in the West. And I think it's because we love dark, evil looking shit and we love the story behind it all. Like it's It's not even just... Cool. It's not even just about dark evil stuff, but it's because Four Ultimate was one of the first monster hunters that actually proper penetrated the Western market. Yeah. Because yeah, the other so ones, really... sure, they, they sold well in some things, but like For You was actually when you started seeing it make it onto mainstream media and people from mainstream media websites going like, oh yeah, I'm addicted to this game, Monster Hunter 4 and whatnot. And I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. There's a lot of new people coming into the franchise. Yeah. yeah. That I just, the, the way that, and this was kind of a, a miss for me in some areas when you compare them. They were both great, but like how Nergigante would appear certain times during World, it never matched the how Gore came up. Like Gore landing on that ship when you're you're going off from uh was it Hearth and you get attacked by him on the ship and then you wash yep. up against the Chico Sands. Like that was just the coolest thing ever, right? I don't know, just like every time you ran into him you were just like, What the hell? Like this thing's crazy and then 
like the different phases when you fought it. Like when its horn came up, they changed the skybox to be all like dark and stuff. And you had a clear target. And when you hit him, it was super satisfying. Like I, I love everything. About I love his stuff bust, is great. busting him up out of his uh, second phase. And then he would like fall over and whatnot. And the sky comes back. And all. Like it's very satisfying. The, the phase transitions that he does as well. I was I was going to make a joke, but then I decided it would be distasteful and be like, oh, it's the monster that was at the end of the movie. <laughs> and then you made huh? it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know. Ho- hopefully we never get, we, hopefully we don't get to see the continuation of that. Uh, that that bad. I still haven't seen the, the Monster Hunter movie at this point. <laughs> you, you've seen it. You've seen the animated version. Yeah, I've, so I've seen point. it. I've seen, uh, was it NCH's yeah, productions? So you, you've yeah. seen the good version of it. So I've seen the idea. better version of it. So it was cool because it's at least kind of like a comedy. So it's funny. <laughs> Valstrax, so uh, the, Valstrax the coming in rocket. at number four. I was super happy because Valstrax is probably my second favorite monster. Although I prefer the Crimson Glow uh, version of him, but it's like, it's whatever. It's Valstrax. Valstrax is Valstrax. So yeah. I'm super happy to see him this high because to me it goes Basel. I mean, Seething Basel, Valstrax. So love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it being hey, up there. Number three, Kogath and everybody else been calling out, but... Look at that nice HQ render of Laggy. I've never seen that before. Tin foil hats. La- Laggy is a hundred percent coming in Wilds. There's no oh, yeah. way that we're not the getting way Laggy they in, don't in get Wilds. Them. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's obviously the most demanded monster, and with this HD model, it looks so damn good. It does, and the thing is, it surprised me because I I know that I personally like Laggy a lot, so I'm super happy it's this high. I wasn't aware that so many people liked Laggy this much. Because, again, Laggy is the flagship of the very first Monster Hunter game I ever played. And even though the game didn't click with me, I still remember the first time that I'm going into the water in that mission where you're supp- I think you're supposed to be getting something from the water and you see Laggy out of nowhere. It's like, what the hell is this? The panic ensues. You're like, I don't know what to do. And Laggy's just coming after you. Like, that was friggin' awesome. I love that. Yeah, but... Yeah, you get flagship power all over the top 10, right? You've got, like, yeah. second generation with Narga Kuga. Portigrex didn't get on there, unfortunately, on the top 10. Yeah. Um, how, how low from, is Tigrex, actually? He's 23. It's a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Zenogre from Portable 3rd, and so you know, kind of Iceborne, Gormagala 4, Vastrax from GU, Nergi World, like, Laggy for Monster to Try. There's something about a monster that you you get to interact with many times that makes it memorable. So yeah, but number two. Sorry, Sedegios. <laughs> Poor Steve. Where 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 is Steve on this list? Where is Steve? Sedegios. Sedegio. Jesus, I have. Do I have to control F it? Is it that low? No, he, number number sixty. Number sixty. Oh my god. Sixty. Poor Steve, all That's the way right. at the bottom. But yeah, number he, two. He, he was twice as far down as Kizu. Good job. Good job, Steve. Number two <laughs> is Nergigante. That's Hells not yeah. surprising. People love Nergigante. He's a tanky boy. He's a beast. I like him too. He was, uh, as as me and a friend of mine, uh, Hengus, we used to talk all the time about how he's a cannibal because he eats other yeah. elder dragons. <laughs> Even though elder dragons is just like, uh, you know, you have this form with things that says flying wyverns, you know, amphibians. And then there's a section that just says, other that's that's other. the elder dragons they're the other section so technically speaking is he a cannibal is he not a cannibal lots of uh discussion on that but yeah um Nergigante is awesome and it's super cool to see him there and then Zenogre, like i knew Zenogre was popular i did oh, not yeah. know it was this popular number one with a bullet yes what a Zenogre beast is very popular i mean it checks all the boxes right it's got yeah. story implications it was the flagship of a game uh it's got but it was the flagship design. it was it's the flagship doggo. of uh of portable third though which again that never even came out in the west yeah yeah exactly that's why it's kind of surprising great, that it makes it all the way up i mean there. it's got guitars electric guitars for weapons true um it, it's a doggo and people love doggos it's one of the best telegraph monsters in the series What's I mean? How could you not like it? And it's got he's a cool got, name. He's got the pimp I'm, strut. <laughs> I am happy they did not call him Zeograph. 
I think that's an okay name, but I think Zenogre is much is better. That, is that what's supposed to be his name, Zeograph? That was that was one of the ones that was on the list. The localization team was talking about playing around, but they, they had already made products of him called Zenogre, so they wanted to keep it similar, so they okay. they went with this. Instead of Jinogre, they went with Zenogre, but it worked out good. So like you said you had uh, a different uh, top yeah, three. Yes, so this is interesting. So, so hit us yeah. up with it. So Japan. If you were taking only the Japan votes, the number three monster was Nargakuga. Okay. The number two monster was Abyssal Laggy. Damn! Abyssal Laggy up at number two. Not even the regular Laggy, Abyssal Laggy. That is very... Is it, I mean, I guess they didn't say if the regular Laggy would still be in the top ten or not in that I list. really wish they released the full list for each territory. For each territory, but yeah. But they didn't. Just the one to three. But yeah, Abyssal on number two. So Japan was the one that drug that boy into the top ten. That's, yep. that's thanks to... Japan uh, and Zenogre is number one. So Zenogre is still number one in Japan. Okay. Yep. North America and South America. I so they the put Americas those two. They put those two together. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Big 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 crowd populations. Uh, big fans in both territories. So it made sense. Number three, Zenogre. Oh, Zenogre actually comes a little bit lower. Yep. Okay. Number two, regular laggy. Number one, Gormagala. Whoa! America uh -huh. really into the edgy and side of the, things. The fan size of North America and South America is huge. It so is I think, I think uh, Gormagala being at where is it number five? I imagine it would be a little bit lower on the list if it wasn't for all that international. Love. For the yeah, for the Americas, yeah. Well, then again, you got some support here because here comes Europe. Number okay. three, Gormagala. Okay, yeah, we we all love Gormagala. Number two, Nergigante. Yeah, so Nergigante is now, very now you know well why Nergigante is it's not Europe. in the top ten, but the top five. It's Europe. Yeah. Number one, regular laggy. Regular laggy number one in Was Europe. Number one in Europe. Oh yep. my god! That, see that I, I would not have expected. Why didn't they not? Why did they not show this on the English stream? I don't know why. I did not expect that regular laggy number one EU. Yeah. Way to now, go. Now, this is EU. interesting. Asia. This is the last category. Number Wait, three. So, so they have Japan and then Asia? Yeah. Okay. Asia, assuming, means more like Southeast yeah. Asia, China, China, uh, Hong Korea. Kong, yeah. Taiwan, all those areas. Uh, probably India as well, whatever. Like anything that's Asia. Yeah. Um, number three, Ruiner Nergigante. Number two, Nergigante. <laughs> he got two spots <laughs> kind of, in the top three. Kind of like a one-track mind over there in Asia. It's like all things Nergi is good. <laughs> Nergi anything stonks. That like a, anything that growls like a dog and swipes like a dog is number one yeah. Zenogre. N okay, Zenogre. Okay, so yeah. N Nergi stonks really high, though. Just like a freaking Ruiner and Nergi on the top three. Yeah, That's but cool. Japan getting Abyssal Laggy up to 12 is just crazy. Yeah, I was really surprised that was Abyssal one that got chosen for that. But uh, yeah, it was really interesting when you see this list. You see definitely, obviously, there's a consensus amongst all the regions. But uh, it's 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 nice to see the little differences, you know. And it's the breakout title, right? Like Zenogre was the breakout title in Japan for Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter Portable 2nd was like, or Portable 3rd was the best-selling game here until world iceborne it sold over 4.8 million copies in japan alone like it's just crazy so it, it was their Por benchmark portable third you said so, portable third yeah yeah it was the biggest title here yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. until recent and then in the west like you said monster Hunter for our ultimate is where it took off so gore magala being at the top makes total sense so much so that a hollywood director begged to have it in the final scene of his we want to go movie to in order to try to get people of course yeah let's go okay i mean fine. the model looked great so i'm sure they probably just said hey look at this cool cg model they're like okay fine you can put it in <laughs> <laughs> um europe though i imagine laggy just yeah that's it's interesting to see laggy way up as number one i guess above i guess it's day, because we had we had those um we had those commercials. I don't know if they aired in the U.S. as well, but we had those commercials. Wait, it was a U.S. actor that made them, but he had like a, 
an Irish or Scottish accent or something. The guy who is like, you see, in life, there's hunters and then there's monster hunters. You remember that? That was the. Actually, the I want to find his name because he passed away recently. Yeah, he passed away so. a couple of years. I think it was a couple What's of years ago, name? actually. I, f I forget. Let's find out. Yeah, so that was Stan Ellsworth, a.k.a. Iron Beard McCullough. Iron Beard uh, is such an amazing name, dude. I <laughs> know. And he, and the quote you were saying was like, in life there are hunters, and then there's monster hunters. Yeah, and exactly. He had a lot of influence, and uh, so, yeah, my thoughts to them. He passed away, it seems, 11 months ago. but uh, Yeah, I, I knew but, Yeah, I knew that could be one of the back. reasons why he's so iconic. With all those tr laggy commercials with him in the background. Rah! Yeah, it was, it was, I, I remember seeing those. I was really hyped up. That, that, that's why I ended up getting that. It's like, I saw the, the publicity and I had a Wii yeah, yeah. and I had my friend that was always telling <laughs> me about like, oh, Monster Hunter is such an amazing game. And I was like, fine, I'll buy it. I even bought like this collector's edition, I had like a little uh, paper box thing that you had on it. So yeah, it's kind of cool. But, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's all the monsters. That's the top stuff and whatnot yeah let uh, me, I'm, I'm curious i am going to check the japanese site really fast i want to see what they called old fatalis oh i wonder Did if it's rebranded or if it's just english only it might be an english That's only thing i feel like probably i would assume so but uh right now they're doing the voting for your favorite background music for a monster yeah, I need, March 13th I need to... to the 27th. And I, I did see a post that you can't choose Kezu because it says there's no BGM for this monster. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> what do how are you going to knock silence? I mean, they had they had to do that because you know it was going to win. It was going to oh, yeah. win. <laughs> People would meme that into oblivion. Oh, yeah. So let's see here. Good old thing. Okay, yeah. So it looks like either... I don't think it's a rebrand. I think it's... It's probably a mistake, but yeah, it's just the uh, the ancestral dragon. Yeah, so it's the same. Is, it's, it's the same Fatalis. thing. Same yeah. name, yeah, in in English. Uh, the, same thing in Japanese as it always has been. So, so yeah. Uh, it is what it is. We'll that's the your... um, that's the Monster Hunter segment. Uh, I figured we also talk a little bit about Dragon's Dogma since I've gotten to play it. We have the character creator. Rub it in, why don't about... you? <laughs> I get to play it. I get to you go get to, to, to the Capcom headquarters and I get to play the game. I had hey, to play like hey was, you earned it. You it earned was, it. You it earned was it. good times. It was good times. I got to, I got to meet Your Eric video was too. cool. You never, you never Everyone's told me video that. video was actually really, really interesting because everybody had different things that they were trying out, uh, different perspectives. So it was a lot more interesting than the marketing I've seen up until this point. So I think that was even the thing. Though they were counting. That was a smart move. They, they were counting on content creators to do the marketing push once we got yep. access to the game. <laughs> hey, why didn't why didn't you give them five hours? Because they would have covered the whole game. You don't want to give them too much. To be to be we'll, honest, we'll, I feel like if I if I didn't have the whole thing scheduled to meet up with Eric's, we could have stayed there longer. We could have played like nobody nobody was stopping us. <laughs> like, <laughs> we could have kept playing if we really wanted to. It was also the thing how do, where how do I ask you about your experience without getting you in trouble? What are I you mean, not allowed to talk about? I can talk about oh, anything. Wait, that would be. I can talk because for starters, I don't have access to the game yet, so I can literally talk about anything. Anything that I saw in there, I can talk oh, about. Oh. There's no, there's no embargoes or anything in regards to the the experience that we had, so we can just talk about anything. As a matter of fact, it was interesting because the, so the the preview build was set up for people to play Magic Archer and Mystic Spearhand. The second I got there, I was like, but. What if I want to play fighter? And they're yeah. like, I mean, you can go change your vocation, do whatever you want. And I was like, oh, okay. So that's cool. Yeah, it's fine. So I played fighter and I played trickster. The only reason why I didn't try more is because the game wasn't set up for the other vocation. So the characters didn't have gear. Yeah. So I would have to sell the gear to buy new gear. And that, you know, you're wasting precious minutes of like a three hour time slot to do that stuff. So I was like, okay, I'll play a little bit of fighter, play a little bit of trickster. And then I also played magic archer and mystic spear hand. So if I can ask just random, cause you, you asked me, Hey, if there's anything you want to ask me, let me know. Yes. 
And like, you know, like the kid who stands up in front of Neil deGrasse Tyson, give me your science question. What do you want to know? And I'm just, ah, my brain's <laughs> just kind of like blanking. There's probably too much I want to know that it just, it just glosses over. And I just want like, I don't know. But I actually have a list of things that either they were talking about or has been a topic. And I wanted to ask you about some of it will deal with your experience. Some maybe not. Um, okay. But I know one of the, the conversation points that I've seen was about the controls between setting your skills because they did mention in an interview for the warfarer which you didn't get to play i yeah. don't believe no no um, it wasn't in the it wasn't in that build so now that they don't have like um was it main weapon and then your sub so you get you like you like before you'd have like the bow and then you'd also have like the daggers knife, like yeah. if you had the daggers but now they're just they're going really focused and saying let's give each one of these jobs a real true one identity yeah. and not have overlaps so just bow for the ranger or whatever right so they're correct me if i'm wrong but people are there were some posts saying like so essentially it's taking you could equip six skills but now it's only four yes this and, is and a... how does that how does that feel so this is a big thing that I've seen a lot of people talk about, and it's interesting because everybody's looking at it as a downgrade. And in my opinion, it's not, because what's happening is, yes, you only have four weapon skills, but every vocation has a vocation special action. So technically speaking, mm. if you were to consider the vocation action a skill, it would be five skills instead of six already. But on top of it, if we look at the Mystic Spearhand, which is the one that I played the most, that vocation skill has a lot more depth than just something that you cast. So the Mystic Spearhand yeah. has this thing called the Redoubted Bolt. You press it, shoots out a little bolt, supposed to flinch monsters. But if you keep it pressed, now it charges. And when you unleash it, it makes them become slower. And then on top of it, when you hit the monsters with it, and then you can press cross, your character teleports to the monster. So it's slowed yeah, and so now you've added teleported in a to it. They've added in like three moves into one. It's like and then utility. there's another one where after it hits the monster, you can press R1 and it kind of like explodes and it paralyzes all the monsters next to it. So already there, there's like all of these combos yeah, that yeah. you can do that it's already almost like three skills in one. And that's just the Mystic Spearhand. Now nice. in the case of the fighter, the vocation skill is guard but you can also use it to parry so those are two things you can do and i don't know if there's more because those vocations had limited things that we could mess around with in the case of the magic archer i think it changes depending on the bow that you have equipped but it gives you either pinpoint volley or rivet shot i think was the name which is kind of like uh gundam missiles essentially where you're just like you know you target and then he goes like yeah, yeah. shoots a bunch of arrows and then for the trickster it moves the simulacrum which is like this effigy thing mm. that you make and gets aggro and whatnot but yeah so so it's, not a concern I, I don't think it's a concern. A lot of people are worried about it. I think it's fine. It's, it's At yeah. bare minimum, it's five skills, but usually the vocation skill brings more to the table than just being a simple skill. So, Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, it was interesting because they were mentioning how the Wayfarer will both to, to have balance. Like one of the four skills is going to be the thing that allows you to switch to your next weapon. So essentially, uh, you'll have three slots instead oh, they, of four. Oh, they said that in uh, in, in an like interview, Jeff yeah. Okay. And then you know the, they also said that it'll have you know so weaker that, so base wait. stats. So wait, if if one of the skills is the swapping thing, that means that they you can still equip three have, weapons. No, but that means that they still have access to the vocation ability. Uh, you don't get master abilities apparently if you're a warfare. Yeah, I which master those are, but master, master abilities I think is like uh, you know how you have high bolide, but then if you master yeah. it, it becomes like grand bolide. I think that's what that oh, okay. is. So you don't have access to those specialization but you, skills, but you will have access to like um, to the vocation ability, which I thought yeah, the, so the, the warfare's the vocation that... ability would be what changes, but I guess not. It's a skill. Okay. Yeah, it says that you uh, you have a swap. Apparently, that it'll swap in the order that you have the weapons set. So it actually matters what order you put them in. Mm. So if you're toggling between one or another, it'll it'll toggle them in order. So you got to think about how you want to do that. Um, and you can use any skills that you got you've learned from any of the individual other jobs. 
That's um, cool. You just can't use the master skills and you get one less and but you know it's it's got lower base stats to balance it out but they it was interesting is in an interview they said it's actually quite tricky to unlock uh so they want it's, people to, i i'm almost wondering if that's going to be the sphinx one of the sphinx sort of things is like if you've solved a bunch of riddles like it teaches you that or something according I don't know. according to what they said unlocking these is basically you have to find the masters so maybe finding the master for the warfare is going to be tricky yeah, and it sounds like you wouldn't want to become a warfare until you already have a, a good enough amount of skills unlocked. Ones, so it sounds yeah. like it might be a mid-game thing, yeah. Yeah. They, they also had some weird, real detailed stuff. They said, like, you know, if you're carrying three weapons, the interviewer was asking, like, what happens to the weight that you can carry? And they said that as long as you have your weapon equipped, it won't, it'll won't. it only take the weight of the heaviest weapon you have of the three that you have equipped. That but if you that doesn't make sense it should take the weight of no i actually no it does make sense the heaviest and they said weapon. if you yeah. yeah yeah and they said but if you change your weapon or you drop it or something then you'll everything becomes an item that you're holding and it be, you you now have to have the carry weight for all of them i'm like hmm? i didn't quite understand what they were getting at there but maybe they're saying you know they want you to pre-plan it they don't want you to just be able to do stuff on the fly and and go to the menu and start swapping stuff out and like, yeah, because you have to be at the the vocation, dude, in order to swap the the skills that you have on your class. So yeah, which I thought was interesting. But um, one thing I was curious: Did you see any NPCs die in your plane? Um, because they do mention in some of the interviews that major NPCs that you're on missions with can die, just like the the other game. But unlike, I guess, the previous game, uh, you can use a wake stone to revive them but only like while their corpse are still fresh for a few days. I've... So they said like if they die, there's like apparently a place in town where they st stock the dead bodies ready for cremation. Yeah. And the, then if, the if you go and you get them back, then you can get them back up if they were an important NPC. But if not, then they're gone for good. So they said the talk to the fortune teller will tell you, hey, I think someone really important died. You might want to go check on them and give you like a hint in case you didn't know. Yeah, it's... um. It's something that they've talked about in interviews, but I didn't really get to mess around too much with that. As as a matter of fact, uh, I think because of uh, because of like concerns, they didn't even want us to like. Please don't film yourself murdering random NPCs. Mm. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, fine, <laughs> that's good. <sighs> so I guess my general question to you is, you know, we were talking so much about the the AI and how good it was in Monster Hunter Sunbreak. Mm -hmm with like the hunters and how that might their AI technology, you know, like their the way that they've developed it might make the pawns feel like way different than they did in the first game, like even better and more humanistic. Like how much did you feel that in your limited They play? felt they felt significantly better than the original Dragon's Dogma, but they're not perfect by design. So they will get killed if you're not <laughs> careful. So even though well, they, they are pawns <laughs> yeah they're, they're pawns they're they're a little bit smarter and they're a little bit better at using abilities so like for instance one of the things that i instantly did for whatever reason was i got the you remember the the shield springboard thing that was like the first yeah. thing i tested so i'm gonna play a fighter and i'm constantly doing shield springboard and they would always run up to the springboard to jump always like the second i would do it somebody would show up to Ooh. jump on it so it seems like they're more responsive but they still die just as easily like there was one time where i was playing the trickster and i just ran into a group of goblins and that got mobbed to death instantly they just destroyed all of them yeah. so because they, you still need to plan things out is what i'm saying yeah they they are literally your pawns you can for better or worse you need to be a good leader <laughs> yeah yeah you have to be a good leader. they will follow you off a cliff if needed <laughs> yeah pretty much they'll still they'll still die they, just as easy so this is weird so one of the japanese outlets ask a question about leveling and how the stats change yeah you know and how in the previous game your stats would change based on what vocation you had on at that point and that was shared across everything so there was like it got really confusing and they were asking if it's the same but you said that the way they had it was the stats that you got when you leveled up was different for each vocation like can you go into detail it on, is. on that so so it's like every vo every vocation gets different stats um, and I've noticed this in the footage even before I got to play the game. So you get different stats depending on which vocation you're playing. But what happens is when you swap vocations, it changes your stats. 
So what I did, and I couldn't even show um, footage of this because they didn't want us to show the menus. But what I did was I just went to the vocation. And I was like, okay, let's look at the strength of the magic archer, which the base strength of the magic archer is 96. And so I was like, okay, now let's change vocations to, what was it? Um, warrior. And the warrior instantly changed it to 196 base without mm. any gear involved. So that's why I was saying, oh, it probably just means that they each get their own thing. Yeah, they had a really weird answer in this interview that made no like sense. I, it said, oh, they said, no, it's basically the same, but we've added caps so that statuses can't go above certain values. So don't worry about it. I'm like, so what? like, I, I actually, what... I actually even have the, the, the photos here. So for instance, the magic of magic archer base, because they have the, the stats shown separately where you have your total with equipment included, and then they have the base. So the base yeah. magic for the magic archer, I, I think this was le at level 25, is 177. And then if we go to warrior, it is 107. So the stats mm. change, and the only thing that I did was change the vocation. And all of these stats changed. Everything is different. So, yeah. Same thing That's for really like good to hear. magic defense is the same thing. Warrior only has 78, whereas uh, magic archer has 138. So, you nice. know. Considering that all of this changed the second that I swapped vocations, I think that they're just going to have you, you know, each vocation grows like this. And if you want to swap them around, do whatever you want. And it also makes sense because if you consider what they said, that the warfare has lower base stats, how are they going to enforce that if you just level up as a warrior? Imagine level 200 yeah. levels of warrior, and then you swap to warfare. It's like, hey, I have the stats of a warrior, but I'm a warfare. Wouldn't work. So that's what they mean. Yeah. At least that's what I think interesting yeah then they were just thinking things like um they were talking to, i was just i'm curious about as i know like the vibe we're getting from the game is that it does it's more intuitive than the first game but it's got very little hand holding like in in a very deliberate sense that they want yeah. things to feel more organic like instead of going up and talking to every npc for a quest like they'll come up to you Mm -hmm. um, because like no one wants just some random dude running around trying to talk to everybody. It's like, what the hell do you want? Did you try talking to random people to see what would happen? Or did, actually, did you notice like a, go ahead. I, I, I was actually, um, with one of the, the, I think it was the magic archer save file. You're running around in town and you just instantly get accosted by one of one person that's in there who sees you running around with pawns and like, we don't like your kind here or something like that. And he sets a bunch of people on me and I had to fight my way out of it. So I never really went out of my way to talk to NPCs, but yet it seemed like the quests were coming to me as I was just exploring the map. Like in, in another situation, there was somebody saying, oh, this person's going to get attacked. I need your help. And it was actually an interesting quest because I, I accept the quest and you go, you know, somebody's getting attacked. I'm probably going to go in there. There's going to be enemies and I kill them. No, you go in there and she just tells you there's an assassin in the middle of all these people. You got to figure out Yeah, that's out what I wanted to ask because they, they actually talked about this in one of the previews from, I think it was V-Jump. They said, as an example of how they don't put markers on everything like modern games. Yeah. Like they give you visual clues and you actually have to like... See, in, in this case, it wasn't a visual clue because all of the people in that ceremony were dressed the same. So what I did <laughs> was I was looking at him and I was like, I don't know who the assassin is, but you could talk to him. And you talk to him and everyone has like a, a bark, basically. They all give you like something, right? So everybody in that room was going like, ah, oh, the goddess of something, blah, blah, blah. All being very worshipy and religion-y and all of this stuff. And then there was one dude... It sounded kind of like this. And he was a wee bit out of place. You know what I mean? He's like, yeah. oh, I really don't understand all this religious nonsense. And I was like, well, you, sir, sound very suspicious. So, and, and here's the thing. As I was talking to everybody, the other character was constantly reminding me, oh, my God, the time is almost over. The ceremony is about to end. The, the thing is going to happen. So there, it, there, there might have been a time pressure in there as well. And so eventually when I, you know, I'm like, I found the dude and I tried talking to her to tell her, hey, it's this guy, but find there's, him. No, there's no option. Yeah. She just keeps saying, find him. And I was like, 
Okay. What so am I supposed you, to do? Think about so you, it intuitively, right? Yeah, like, what so, would you do? So what would you do? What's the one thing that you can do? In, you in, grab the son of a bitch. You grab him. So I grab them and my character strip tackles him to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oi, are they on to me? And it's like, yeah, could you be more obvious? <laughs> and yeah, so I found uh, the assassin that way. And it was, it was a neat little quest that didn't really have much else to, to do. Yeah. And they just thank yeah, you. Yeah, they use whatnot. that as an example. Uh, they were talking about that. Not... It's not necessarily handholding because they're like all the tips are there. They're, they said apparently yeah. in that mission, there's tips about like the way that they had their hair. There were some eyewitnesses that give you some information that are tip offs or something about a scar in their leg or arm or something. Like oh yeah, there was like, there's, there there's was plenty of clues, but the that, game doesn't yeah. like tell you hey, you go find the guy and you get this little marker walking around the yeah, room and you just got to no, go no. and press the B button, which there, would there go I imagine button. to making it feel more organic's not the right word, but more immersive maybe i don't know oh yeah it was it was it? it was way more it was way more immersive the way that they're doing quests here because that they're really ha i haven't seen any markers at all like there's nothing that tells you oh you got to go here do this i guess there was one quest that i was trying to do where they did have a marker on the map but i think it just signified like hey we know there's something happening in this area and it tells you hey here's where this area is the map yeah. was actually a little bit confusing because of um for starters i don't like rotating maps and by default the thing is rotating i like them static uh you, you can hard set it to north though, you, right? you, I you you probably can hard set it to north it's just i didn't waste any time going through settings but uh the the mini map that you see is um is different from the actual big map so that made it a little bit confusing but you can place markers everywhere and then you can just look at mm. your compass and be like ah this is the direction of my marker and you instantly can orient like that but i think there is going to be a bit of an adaptation period for some of us to get used to the way the map yeah. works but no it was, it was cool it was cool it was immersive all around in terms of quests and stuff now it seems like it's gonna be interesting because they keep talking about interviews that they call it a, a fantasy life simulator simulation and i guess the the whole idea behind that is that it's supposed to be like the backyard after school like telling your friends dude dude, dude there's this thing over here They're like well you could do that you know and they, they try to go into the mind frame of like i guess Baldur's gate like if you think you can do it you should be able to do it yeah so they're like you know like safe elevators or or bridges like yeah you could totally break that and just screw everything if you wanted to like, and there's, or it could happen. Like, don't if you're getting chased by a griffin, don't go there because it's going to destroy the bridge, and you kind of need that. So there's. But it a, sounds like they all. Have... Go, go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I was saying. So there's um there's this thing, where I was, running around the world, and you're talking about the, um, the kind of like sandbox aspect of it, right? Yeah. And one of the interesting things that, that people have mentioned is you're supposed to get tips through pawns, right? But there are some people that they're thinking like, oh, but I don't want the pawns to tell me the solutions to quests. So whenever you're near uh, a location where a pawn might have relevant information, the pawn will go like, hey, I know things about this place. And then it's like, it's your you choice. Press button. If, if you don't tell him, like, it's, it's the instruction go, like you had in the original one, because you yeah. can tell them go, come, whatever, right? Yeah, take so if you, if you hit him with go, then he goes like, okay, I'll guide this to the thing. But if you don't say anything, then he's, okay, that's it. He doesn't he give you any him, input. just like, shut up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he, and he, shut he up, will chat. not. Uh, the mod's got him. <laughs> he, he will not uh, continue giving you information about any of that stuff. So people that we were in e mode, mode that, only. Yeah. You, you don't get to talk. But yeah, it's, no it's, tips it's, it's, a player, it's a player <laughs> a player option that uh, that you can have or not have depending on whether you want it or not. The other interesting thing was you were talking about how it's kind of like a, a life simulator in a way. And one of the things yeah, that always gets saying, yeah. One, one of the things that people always bring up is the fast travel because they're like, oh, I actually want to have fast travel. Not having fast travel is annoying. You do have fast travel. What, it, what I've noticed is it seems like so long as you're, and again, this is based off of three hours of playtime, so don't take it too no. granularly, but it seems to me like so long as you're close enough to a road, with a certain amount of frequency, ox carts will show up. And you can yeah. go to the ox cart, you give the guy some money, and then just he will take you to the nearest Hop town, around. and then you can go to... From that town, you can take an ox cart to somewhere else that you want to go to. But what I think it's going to be like is, say there's five cities along the coast, right? You want to go to the northernmost city. 
probably you have to take an ox cart to the closest one and then from there take the ox cart to the next one this is my assumption i don't actually know if that is the case or not but yeah and the ox cart the way that it works i mean they is, do mention that they do have teleport crystals that you can use it's yeah you just, have port it's crystals going to cost and important and resources stones. yeah it'll cost resources so it's not something you'll just be able to spam all over and probably until in game or you would even want to because it sounds like the focus is more on the the unscripted stuff that happens in between those yeah. things are supposed to be the meat of the game and the fun part. Yeah, but what I'm saying is I, I just think that fast travel is probably not going to be as big of a problem as people are making it out to be because you just take the ox cart and it's fine. I yeah. think. I'll see. I, I don't actually know. It's just, again, based on three Upgraded, hours. Upgraded, it becomes a taxi, right? The, the ox, <laughs> Uber. <laughs> no, because the, the way that it works, right, is once you're in the ox cart and you give them money, it's not like you have to sit there and wait. You press I just say, triangle. It's not like the it's not like the chocobo, right? Like where you're literally just no, it's just no, doing no, auto no. walk and you have to watch the whole damn thing. No, 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 no. You you doze off. You press a button to doze off and ah, it teleports nice. you. So what and happens is maybe an is, event occurs. Maybe it maybe doesn't. an event occurs when when you doze off. But yeah, you you just press the button doze off. In my case, I only did it once, but it instantly just took me to town. I mean, it just oh, nice. leaves you outside okay. the gates. And that's it. It's, you know, it just but it's leaving up that possibility that if you had heard yeah. reports of bandits loose outside the city, maybe this might not be the night to to just fall asleep on a random ass cart going to yeah. another town. You might get attacked. But that's the okay. That's that sounds good. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. I mean, it sounds like it's got like you know things we loved about Baldur's Gate with freedom of choice. It seems like it's got like Breath of the Wild inspirations with like. If you can think about it, you should be able to do it, and it's very physics based. Um, I like the idea. I I know right now there's like a debate uh, on the Twitter space. There always is, right? Yeah. Uh, about like the number of vocations, and oh my god, are they reducing the number? But it sounds like they're adding a whole lot of depth and personality to each one now. That's, so that's can... the thing to me. People are complaining about there only being ten vocations, and that's I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking to myself, I would rather have. 10 really well fleshed out vocations than yeah. you know 20 that are maybe a bit more generic so as long as they you know assuming that when we get to the higher levels we actually have really big depth in these class in these vocations i think that's more important than just having more of them yeah and potentially we might I'm, I'm assuming that we'll eventually get like an ultimate version of the game and maybe they'll unlock a couple of more because like there's a lot of people that want the mystic knight which i can relate to but the Mystic Spear Hand is so fun that, you know, it's... Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the, the short video that I made with uh, the the Mystic Spear Hand Yeet? Yeah. It's got the thing where it just, like, throws a monster and <laughs> goes, woo! <laughs> it's just getting yeeted. But you don't get loot from it when you do that. You don't get the monster's loot. So here's, here's a weird question. Is everybody in the game just really tall? Because one of the things that sort of broke my heart when... I've been having a lot of fun with the character creator, and I've spent I think eight hours on it already. Damn! Like I, you saw you saw my Neil newborn uh, pawn yeah. and then all those others, and I'm having a blast with it because it, it really it seems like oh this is cool. There's lots of options, but then when you really start digging into it, that you're like oh damn, this seems really deep. Um, but I was really sad to see that the minimum height is 160 centimeters because you know I like to play as. And, and this is not like a lolly thing or something. Like I like to play as small, small characters. characters, especially yeah. in Dragon Dogma One, because it gave me a lot of disadvantages, like being able to jump length or whatever. But it gave me a lot of advantages that were unique to that frame. Like I can run underneath an ogre's legs. I could. I had stamina like you wouldn't believe. But it seems 160 is the lowest you can go. And I was like, what? Yeah, I was. I was actually surprised it was only 160. Like to me, that's perfect because I think that's like the perfect. Uh, size for a dwarf it's 160 yeah. so it's not too small but i do think that you could do them small how smaller could you make them in the original oh i mean my character is probably no more than god she couldn't be taller than maybe 120 130 or something she was pretty small she was freaking tiny 120. and yeah and, and my main pawn That's was a, a midget the biggest tallest big ass guy you can possibly imagine I mean, and he would cover me like when a harpy grabbed me it was like they were grabbing a feather, so they were just flying around and throw me off edges and kill yeah. me and stuff. But I was so small, I can run up to a drake who had its head down towards the ground, and I could just jump and grab its chest straight from default because I was so small I can get under his chin. It was really fun. So in the in the preview build, most 
NPCs I interacted with were average size, and we couldn't really create characters in the preview yeah. build, so I, I don't know much more. I guess that. with physics based stuff, if you want to really balance it, you kind of have to do that. Yeah, but I was a little little sad for someone who likes the the. I like the idea of the the small fry. You know, that's my. I'm I'm glad archetype. that at least we can be like 160. Even though I kind of wanted even a little bit smaller for my dwarves, but still 160 should be fine. But yeah, I, I, I wanted to be able to create them even smaller, but still, character yeah. creator is absolutely One, insane. What's 160 for, for our listeners in the Americas? 160 centimeters to feet. Cause they I, need I, to I, convert to metric. That's what they need to do. Yeah, what, what is that? It's tiny. It's probably like 4.8, four, 4.7, four, I think. 5.2 feet. Wait, really? 5.2 feet. 1.6 one is 5.2? Okay. I thought it'd huh? be four eight for some reason. Yeah, five point two five feet. Yeah. So, average height for a smaller frame adult, I guess. But you can. But be... you're not going to be having. You're not going to be having like Lala fell and you know traditional no, no, athlete no, no. like no, heights no, running no. around or anything. I imagine because they probably found out that if you went too small, you can just bust most of the puzzles in the game. Like if you were really small, like in the original game, there was like the goblin camp. You remember when you had to get there and way in the yeah. west. And you can like just sneak through sneak. any little tunnel that they made for the goblins. You can get through them as a small character. It didn't matter. Like it's like what up? <laughs> you just be doing that crazy stuff. But yeah, you can, I imagine QA is just something. like, yo, we can totally break this game if if you keep doing this. Like they're too small. It's like okay, let's let's make a baseline here. But you can do some crazy stuff with that character creator. So that's fun. So an interesting new mechanic that I don't know if people are aware is that now, besides just grabbing onto monsters and climbing them, right, you can grab onto them to throw them off balance. So like you can... So, cool. so having you, a heavy character might actually be really it, it, it interesting, might, right? But like you can grab onto, say, an, uh, a Cyclops' leg and you can like push and pull to tip him over. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I was thinking about trying to make like a God Skin Duo type of chunky boy that could just throw himself at enemies and try to jump on them and throw them overboard <laughs> as i sit back as a ranger and just peg their face off that might that might be something that you'll be able to do what's uh what vocation are you shooting for <laughs> literally shooting for i i gotta go ranger it's my my it's my not called ranger go anymore it's okay. archer oh, uh, archer ranger archer but archer, is it the, the regular one or the magic archer regular one so, do you know that the magic archer can shoot an arrow that resurrects pawns? I'm sure it can do a lot of cool things, but I'm sure the the archer will have equally, if not better. Things. <laughs> I I will play all of the vocations, but is my you first just, play. You just want blasting arrows. Let's be real. Come on. I now. no 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 no. Even those <laughs> were. That was just fun when you were bored to just break the game. That was, that was like the the Kelby bow, right? In three G. Yeah. You just, you just blast but, monsters open with blast arrows. No, it's just, I mean, if you were to drop me in a fantasy world, that's my that's the archetype that I would first try out is I like bows and archery. So mm. I think that's what I'll take. How very disappointing. The thing that I'm really stuck on is I know from the first game how much you become attached to your main pawn. Like, they really are a main character. Yeah. And so do I make them, do I start, because you'll... We say make them a vocation, but we'll, they'll end up playing everything, of course. But it's like, yeah. do I ha do I have a thief who can use daggers and be really fast and close where I'm far away, or do I have my typical, you know, the rock, you know, running around and just brrr, you protect protect no, me? No, you, you can know? you can use my pawn for that because my my official pawn is going to be a fighter, and I'm going to make him nice. like the best tank ever, and I'm also going to give him. 100% I'm giving him shield springboard. Mm. So th so that is like if you want to go Over aerial, here. he'll be he'll Bing. be there with the shield springboard to to cover you. And so he's going to have at least shield springboard and shield summons. The other two I'll figure out what I'm going to do. But yeah, he's going to be yeah. big tanky like the whole shebang. As a matter of fact, I designed my pawn as if he was my main character. So my nice. main character is actually going to be the secondary character so that anybody who takes my pawn is going to be like you're playing with me. <laughs> which yeah. means if you just walk into goblins you'll get yourself slaughtered why why <laughs> why are you like this no he will destroy all the goblins in one fell swoop he will take the glory yeah so 
I, if you think you're going to do like weapon previews or, or guides or just like introduction of cool mechanics to try out, I'm sure the first vocation that you choose is going to be the first one that you tackle, which was, was going to be your starting vocation. My starting vocation is going to be fighter. fighter. I mean, nice. actually, for for my for my first playthrough, it might not be fighter. Actually, it might be thief. Dude, because okay. the the pawn is going to be fighter. Hey, you can use my pawn then. You can have a a starion with you. And are, oh, I know you love it, him. Are you going to make a starion your main pawn? I don't know. I'm still. I'm, Please don't. I'm, Please do literally any other have... any other Baldur's Gate character. I don't want to bring a starion decided. into my party. No. <laughs> Bad memories from that dude, okay? Uh, <laughs> you're no fun. Oh, one cool thing I did notice that Make one of the interviews in Japan. Yeah, but the, you can't put horns on your pawns, so that was out of the question. So. Oh, damn it. I know. Um, I did see that in one of the interviews in Japan, they confirmed that there is going to be an in-game item you can get that will allow you to redo... Um, your character creator if you want to redo your entire yeah we parent. we had we had that item uh on us uh on the, thank on god the because build. i get like i get I'm getting like traumatized flashbacks from monster Hunter team doing like character creator voucher crap and i don't I ever hope, want to see that again i hope they don't i do never that. want to see that again but the, the way they is, worded it sounded like an in-game that's, that's gonna be a thing though like for because it was already in and rise I, as I, well I, they did it in Rise I know. Too. I say this as someone who pays money to buy Fantasia every now and then. So, like, I, I'm, I'm kind of a hypocrite. Uh oh. Hey, I, I can call it out. <laughs> hey, I can call out my hypocrisy all I want. It's there, yeah. but, but I, I, I don't agree. change I don't my, like my class anymore. I'm stuck. I'm, I'm going to be, is even though it's the meme, like Miko is, is my race in that game forevermore. Makote. So, yeah, not changing that. Cute cat girl. But the. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Cute There's a reason girl. I it's, married it's, it's, you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, the reason actually is the, the emotes. The emotes match the personality of my original character really yeah. well. And I it, the, I don't want her to be shy or timid or mean or condescending. She's really just a energetic type. So Miko fits it well. But I'm kind of curious like for this, how, how plentiful that might be because... They got two completely different types of characters, right? You got the furries, and then you've got the the normal ones, and the beast I don't know friends if I'll be and the human. Are you going to be a beast friends? friend? Yeah, that's what they're called, beast friend. See, the thing is, I think I might save that for FF14 Dawn Trail because it's like kind of funny. At the same time, they're both coming out with the same new. Oh race. yeah, t t true. Because they're coming up with the, so, the female uh, Rogath in 14 as yeah. well. Yeah. So I'm like, what do I do? I don't. Or do I make my pawn? that i don't know i haven't make played there's pawn, so many things i want to do i might just make my friend. pawn be the beast friend yeah yeah that might be the way to go they look great though all of them they do like the, uh, the character creator has so much depth to it it is insane it's a, it's actually a, a genius idea that they released the character creator ahead of the game as a matter of fact, I forget who it yeah. was. I think it was a rat at Now, you, now you've spent all this time. Yeah, you exactly. are now committed. You can't get out. Now you <laughs> have to committed. Play. It was a genius ploy to get people it addicted was. to it by getting them committed to their characters. Here's here's a random question I just thought of. The first game suffered a little bit, especially mid to end game with optimization when it came to menu loading. Like when you went, when you opened up your menu of items, it took like a yeah. second to load. Does did, this, did you notice that at all in this? No, this one felt fine. No real issues with that. I'm actually curious. How do you feel about the whole 30 FPS thing? A lot of people are talking about the 30 FPS thing. Because um, like I've played it right, and it is yeah. 30 FPS. Sometimes it even dips below that because the version that we played yeah. was uh, PS5. Um, and it's like, would I prefer 60? Always 60 or more. Always prefer that. Like. 30 fps is not cinematic i don't care <laughs> cinema oh it's so much more no it's not i uh, know uh, more fps is always better but i would not stop myself from playing it just because it's at 30 fps yeah. was the pacing good like it was on the other one where like at, you know when you first start you're like okay it's a little okay this is lower frame rate but then after like 30 minutes your eyes start filling in the frames and it becomes smooth to your eyes yeah, is that what you I'd got from this one yeah, I, I never really felt like, oh, this frame rate is impacting my gameplay. 
never felt like yeah, that. So I, I was like, oh, this I almost feel like it's maybe there's a difference with people. Maybe some people, they don't ever have that moment where after X amount of minutes or hours yeah. that your your brain starts to fill in those extra frames and everything looks and feels Normal. as smooth as you know that it feels when you play 60 FPS yeah. with a few dips here and there. But that's more of like, I think it affects people differently. It, so I think maybe some people who are only used to playing games at 30 will say, I don't see the difference because they're so used to playing 30 that they wouldn't know that you don't even get that by default. Like on 60, you don't even have to get into it. Like it's just smooth from the get go. I and think that's kind of cool. I think that a majority of people are able to tell the difference between 30 and 60. Bad actors, uh, you think? I, I don't know if it's bad actors or if they just think that they can't, but then if you actually put something side by side and be like, okay, look, sit down and actually look at these things yeah. for more than two seconds and tell me yeah. you can't see a difference. I think if you actually do that to somebody, yeah, that they're like, no, they're I, watching, can, I can tell They're the watching difference. 60 FPS stuff on the 30 FPS monitor. <laughs> yeah. But like the um, the the thing is, there is a percentage of people. I I, I remember I asked Chat GPT to like run a simulation and try to figure out the percentages or something like that, and the speculation ended up being around thirty percent, based on like whatever data these AI model language models have. Yeah. It said probably around thirty percent of people actually can't see the difference. But this is mostly people, like in the example, what ChatGPT mentioned, which was something that I hadn't even considered, is like, these are people that aren't like staring at screens for too long. You're talking about somebody that works in Sorry, a farm, worse. for instance, right? They're working in a farm and, you know, that's what they do. They're outdoor all day, whatever. And then they look at a screen and 30 FPS and 60 FPS and they're like, whatever, right? So you for know what I really people, enjoy? it's not like, going to matter. Yeah sit there playing a 60 fps game or higher and then all of a sudden look at like a 24 fps scene like a film and yeah. at first it looks like a slideshow and you're like what the fuck <laughs> yeah. but when you're in a movie theater watching stuff it doesn't feel like that you're like there's nothing cinematic about this this looks horrible but when you just sit down and watch it your eyes just adjust yeah you know, they, it, they adjust yeah. and it feels that and because it's not a frame rate that you're used to seeing in normal life it feels cinematic because you feel detached from it like you're watching it where 60 feels like home video camera level because that's kind of more closer to what you're used to seeing normally. Yeah. But I mean, I'm in the crowd. I'm going to be playing it on PC. Um, I'm probably I am, playing on, I'm, I'm I am play on PC as well. Yeah. I'm probably going, I might have to update Yuna's PC. I don't know because it couldn't what, run uh, the character GPU? creator at uh, 3070 S. Oh yeah, that is getting kind the of The thing low. is, but it couldn't, it didn't quite have enough memory to run the character creator in 60 FPS at 4K. Hmm. I I mean, we'll try putting it in like 14... I don't think the TV supports 1440, but we'll see. Um, but if I have to, I might have to... Things, I don't want to replace the motherboard, and the CPU was really strong, so I, I don't think that's an issue for gaming. Uh, I mean, it runs at 4 gigahertz base, so that's more than enough for any game i think it's more gpu side but it's memory intensive so i might need to upgrade and, and look at what that board supports hmm. Hmm. because yeah i do want to play it in 60 but I, I, mean, I played in 30 of course i mean i did i the think first game didn't uh didn't then video came out with uh the g4 supers now or whatever i think that they should be a little bit more affordable now i don't know i haven't looked at the pc market i know it's japan nothing's affordable so yeah yeah right you have mentioned that stuff is even more expensive over there it's freaking wild yeah so but i do want to play it uh i mean our thing is that we more than the fps i appreciate i think these days no not more that's the wrong way to say it um Frame rate, I, I, I like the most, of course, for gameplay. But I think as, as games are getting richer, I'm appreciating more having the 4K textures, having that level it of is, detail. I, there there's is something, something very I like in FF like 16, even on the PS5. It's some of the details in FF 16 and some of the like environments, everything. I would just stop and just I will like literally just walk around looking at stuff because i enjoy it so much the design the one it's the pretty. one that kind of the one that kind of clicked for me with that was actually seven rebirth because i was playing it and i was like ah 60 fps no brainer don't care 
And then a lot of people were talking about how like, man, the game actually looks way better at 4K. And I was like, all right, let me let me check it out. And I was like, damn, damn, we're making a lot of sacrifices for these frames. Uh, I don't know about that. So that one is like one like, of the first like ones that made me question did, like, it. Yeah. yeah, 16 had it where like no matter what setting you were on, the battles were like 60. But everything outside of it could be really, you know, lower frame rate, higher detail. And that's what I went for. Like, for the important parts that are going to be motion blurred to death anyways, yeah, sure. I'll take a lower, you know, level of detail, but I really like that detail. So, yeah. I, I don't know what we're going to do, but I I definitely want to play it. I I mean, I'm the person who went out and bought an Xbox Series X just so I can enjoy the majority of my Monster Hunter World playthrough <laughs> in what I felt would be the, the best version at the time. Of course, yeah. the PC version blows it out the water, but... Yeah. I've just been <laughs> the thing is I've been playing them PC games a lot more than anything. I haven't touched my consoles in a while. Yeah. Um I've, but it's I've it's been... a hell of a lot more expensive. So I mean the allure of consoles is certainly unmatched. I've been like, playing just a play lot of stuff games. on I've been playing a lot of uh, multi plat stuff on PC as well recently because I got a, a new PC to, to have at home so that I can render stuff out there as well. Yeah. And yeah, I've because mo- the thing to me was I've always been all about physical media, and it seems like now most console manufacturers, except maybe Nintendo, they don't even care about physical media because like whatever comes out on the discs usually is not even the full game anymore. So the disc is basically a glorified yeah. license, and I'm just like, well, I mean, you know, if we're not getting physical media, I'll just buy stuff on PC because it's cheaper. The games are yep. cheaper on PC. It's like, what do you want from me, you know? And I don't subscribe anymore to Nintendo Online or PlayStation Online. I don't want to pay for the online servers anymore. I really don't. Yeah, that's the I don't. Thing. I don't get enough out of that. Game Pass I still subscribe to, even though I don't, there I'll go months without pl- playing a game on it. But then there's, you know, that random month I'll pick up a game and play it. And as long as I play two to three games a year off that, I'm yeah, getting my money back. So, like, at that point, worth. I'm... It's like Netflix. I'll go a month without watching it, but then I'll binge something. I'll be like, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. So. But yeah, PC, I do care about it. But I I think, but the character creator had the option, at least on the PC side, to do a lock to 30, lock to 60, lock to 90, then 120, 144, and then variable fresh rate. Yeah. And I don't know where the PlayStation is at currently when it comes to variable refresh rate, but I know that the Xbox has been fantastic for that. I have a HDMI 2.1 monitor with a, you know, 145, 165 and variable refresh rate. And it really does make quite a difference when it comes to those like that variance. Like it's almost mm-hmm. like what I, I consider it's like, um, what would you call it? The, uh, in an airplane turbulence turbulence uh modifier like it, it lowers the amount of turbulence by a huge amount and so the game may not be that smooth but it certainly looks and feels smoother um i don't know if hdmi 2.1 i know it's not even that common still yet because that's the hdmi cable that comes it's pretty with built it's in. pretty common now 2.1 well these monitors i don't know if the, oh, how yeah. common people have because the, if your monitor supports it, I think the PlayStation supports it now, but variable frame HDMI rate, yeah. 2.1 has its own version of variable refresh rate. It's not quite as good, I think, as like a system integrated version of it, but it's still good, I think. I don't know. I could be totally wrong, so just correct me in the comments. I've been, but I've been using, when it comes to PC, I've been using mostly the DisplayPort at this point. Uh, yeah. Because but usually like variables, like you, you generally want to lock it. Yeah, the the the, th- the thing about HDMI is that the HDMI handshake technology has been so frustrating for anybody that uses a capture card. HDMI handshaking sometimes. Oh, now uh, it doesn't work. Yeah. So now remove hi, it from bye, the hi, TV bye. and plug it back in. Re-plug now it remove in. it from the other side and plug it back in. And it's like, back whoa. In, yeah. Listen, giving a handshake ain't that hard, okay? Your HDMI handshaking sucks. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we got some uh, some hyped. good times ahead with uh, Dragon's Dogma 2. It's going to be absolutely awesome. But We're eating yeah. good this year. Speaking of eating good, you need to go make Yuna dinner. Yes, slacker. I need to make dinner. It's like 9.30 p.m. I know people are like, wait, what the hell? You having dinner at 9? It's like we usually <laughs> eat dinner at 9.10, so that's not new. Yeah. But uh, I'm sure that'll change as, as 
schedule's getting stricter. But, oh, yeah. Uh, no, it's yeah. been fun catching up, man. And thanks for the, the name drops. You dropped my name twice during that Capcom thing. I mean, of course. I felt love. <laughs> I felt love. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the truth. Like, I, th- that's one of the things about Monster Hunter is just the friendships that you end up making. It's really, really cool. It's been fantastic. It was a nice panel, though. The five of you guys were a good mix, I think. Yeah, I think it was awesome. I I finally got to meet Vampy. I hadn't spoken with Vampy at all, and it was uh, it was really cool. She's very nice. Yeah, one day I'd like to talk to her. I follow her a lot. You haven't spoken to other, her yet. I haven't actually gotten the chance to speak with her yet. One oh, day. Oh damn. We need to, we need to bring her on the podcast. There you go. Problem solved. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can I schedule it? Ah, you you ready for it? <laughs> Just like putting let, the let pressure on. <laughs> let, I don't even know what we're gonna talk next because Dragon's Hunter Two is gonna take up my entire life once yeah, it comes yeah. out. I'm, I have an obsessive personality. You know that from yeah, I FF can tell. Sixteen and <laughs> Baldur's Gate. I mean, we'll do we'll do a podcast on Dragon's Dogma Two as well. I'm sure whenever yeah. we get around to playing it. So yeah. yeah. But anyway, that's gonna be it for now, team. Thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode of the Third Fleet Podcast, hit the like button, subscribe, bell notification icon, all that jazz. We'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong. Stay safe. And happy hunting. Happy hunting. <laughs>